What up, my fellow Monarch Monstars? It is your boy Trey of the Bat Channel, and we are live once again, going in hot on this insanely incredible Monarch Legacy of Monsters show on Apple TV. We are going to break down the latest episode, Secret and Lies, episode three out of ten. We're not even halfway there, guys. And I have watched this episode four times now, four times. I'll tell you guys why a little later, but essentially I watched it, you know, with you guys during our watch party, had a great time. Thank you for everyone who showed up. But the second time I watch it, you know, when you're, when you're doing it live with you guys, I kind of pay attention to the chat. I'm kind of looking to see what's going on. So sometimes I'll miss quick little details. So the second time I always watch it with my wife because, you know, she's, she's interested. She wants to check out what's going on in the Godzilla world. And when I was watching with her, something came up and I was like, that's really interesting. And then it popped up again. I was like, all right, I, I, if, am I crazy? What's happening here? Literally did a whole bunch of research to see if anyone else was talking about it. And as far as I can tell, no one's really brought it up. It's kind of been like, this was weird. I don't know what that was about. And I was like, no, 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 no. There's something huge about that detail. So we're going to talk about a little later in our little theories and predictions and Easter eggs. Uh, and also, the, another thing I do want to talk to you guys about. So some of you know, first off, I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. So glad to see everyone in the chat. Uh, hopefully Black Friday wasn't too crazy or insane. <laughs> and you survived. Uh, and now you're ready to settle down a little bit with some great Godzilla discussion. So make sure you guys are smashing that like, you're sharing this video, you're subscribing if you haven't already. Hit that notification bell. Invite all of your fellow Godzilla fans into the chat right now because we got a lot of big things to discuss. And as always, follow us on our social media pages like TikTok, Instagram, Threads, uh, Twitter, at the underscore Bat Channel. It's a great way to get to know us, to talk with us, DM us, tell us what's going on in your life, or some cool things you guys noticed about the episode that like, dude, you got to talk about this. Or maybe something else that came up uh, of a different IP that you guys are interested in that you would like to see us maybe do a video on. We'll, we'll take a look at it. It's just a great way to, to get in touch with us. If you're still on Facebook, at Holy Bat Channel, you know, you already know. Um, something cool happened during Thanksgiving for me. Uh, not only did I get to spend it with family and you know, just really enjoy company. I, I missed my super bro, Corey, the best co-host I could ever ask for. And my, my parents who were, uh, who were celebrating with him this year. But Jesus, Bat Dan, he always had to come in with the snakes. <laughs> uh, but I was talking with my father-in-law and he was just like, so uh, you're really digging, you know, we were talking about Monarch and he's like, okay, so when are you going to go see the Godzilla Minus One movie? Because we're going to Arizona this weekend for like an entire week. So it's going to be the Super Bro Corey channel here soon. Uh, he's he's going to be in charge for a whole week. Hopefully, hopefully he, he does some stuff. Put pressure him, guys. Put him, Make him do some videos for us. <laughs> but I was talking with my father-in-law, and he was like, you going to go see Godzilla Minus One. And I was like, dude, I ain't missing it. He's just like, well, how are you going to go see it if it comes out the day right you know, when we're like doing stuff for the wedding? I was like... I'm not seeing it December 1st. He's like, oh, so are you seeing it when we get back? Because he's like, I want to, I'm thinking about going to see it with you. And I was like, my father-in-law wants to see the movie with me? I was like, first off, I'm going November 29th. I'm going to the fan screening early showing. And he's like, how are you going to go? We're in Arizona. Where are you going to see it? I was like, Todd, there's, there's theaters in Arizona that I'm going to go see. And he was like, all right, I'm down. So all of a sudden it became, all right, he's going to go see Godzilla minus one with me and my wife. And then it became his best friend who lives in Arizona, who we're attending his son's wedding. And then his other son is joining us. So literally we got this whole gang together going to see Godzilla. Wait, minus wait, one. A so, wait a second. You say in the night before the wedding, the dude is getting married. is going to be out watching Godzilla. Uh, his brother is <laughs> and his father. <laughs> I don't know what he's, I would assume he's probably, you know, gearing up with uh, his forget the trip club you're going to see Godzilla, you're going to see Godzilla you know like but hey when I was you know hearing that everyone just kind of it became like a big giant group that was going to go see Godzilla minus one beautiful I was I was like this is gonna be awesome this is gonna be a damn good time 
So, uh, like we probably won't be able to do like a whole, um, video until I get back, but what I'll at least try to do is like an out of theater reaction that I'll send to Corey to maybe upload as a YouTube short real quick. Uh, but I'm excited. You guys already know. So as always, you heard his voice already. So let me go ahead and bring him in. The best co-host I could ever ask for, a super bro. Corey, how's it going, big fella? So you are sitting there as a place for gun toting Neanderthals. I, What's yes, up, buddy? Absolutely. <laughs> How's One it going, of my favorite lines of that uh, uh, Godzilla 3, man, uh, are the uh, Monarch Monsters episode. Uh, oh, man, I'm all over the place today. Monarch Legacy of Monsters episode 3. Woo! You know, it's uh, it's just part of it, Corey. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm just pumped that you're seeing Godzilla minus one on November 29th. Yeah, dude, I, I, I'm uh, going to miss it. I saw that uh, they will be having uh, um, Godzilla minus one here in town, so I will be seeing it December 1st, most likely, because I didn't see anything on uh, no- November. Or Not doing so. the, the early screening for you guys? No, I didn't see an early screening. So if that's the case... We'll see it on Friday. All right. I dig it. That that works. Mm-hmm. Any way you can do it, my man. That's that's what it's all about. Guys, obviously, get, first off, get, get your tickets for Godzilla Minus One. Let's make it the biggest U.S. opening for mm. a Toho Godzilla film in history. Uh, I think, if I recall, I think we got to beat $16 million for Shin Godzilla. I think that holds holds the record currently for a Toho film. So, oh, we're going to beat it. I think so. Hopefully. We're gonna, we're gonna um, be. So make sure you guys get your tickets. Do the fan early screening. I know Beyonce is taking up some showings. Punk. Uh, but hey, you know, she, she wants to she ride that Taylor Swift train, which is all right. Hey, if you like Godzilla, put a ring on it. <laughs> um, but man, it's, it's, it's going to be a great time. Uh, guys, make sure you hit that notification bell because we're going to be continuing our Monarch streams that we're doing all mm. around with the, the watch parties the discussions uh so we've already had one and two and done our third watch party so we're, we're having a damn good time guys so be on the lookout for setting your reminders for our next show episode four parallels and interiors uh watch party gonna be on thursday because now they're they're back on friday they just did uh wednesday or tuesday depending on what time zone you were in uh, a little early because of Thanksgiving. But Corey, I think we should just go ahead and bring in our, our next member on the panel who was here recently with us. It was so good seeing him. Uh, but let's go ahead and bring in our boy, Josh. Yo! My man. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody yes. said Godzilla put a ring on it. <laughs> I mean, Josh, he's a big, are you going to go see the, the Beyonce film? I know you're I, a big Beyonce I, fan. I, unfortunately, Godzilla, I love you. Uh, I will be bending the knee to my queen, a titan in her own right. Beyonce will own me all weekend. However, after this episode <laughs> and watching it two times, which is very rare for me, I have decided to make Godzilla Minus One my first ever theatrical, Toho theatrical experience, watching it in 4DX on Tuesday. The following Ooh, and you're doing the, the 4DX, huh? Toho movie. I don't know if y'all know about 4DX, but with the actual like moving seats effects, it's like a like yeah. a Disney. Movie. What? So that's cool. That's amazing. Found it on Tuesday after I think it's like December 5th or something. So I'll be paying yeah. a little bit. <laughs> but uh yeah, I have a date with Godzilla, just like you guys. Nice. Um, I was about to say, it, 4D, does Godzilla come crash the party or something like that? It sounds try, like he does. I'm going to try. I looked. There's no seats sold right now. But I'm going to try to just, like, take little snippets if the theater's not full of, like, the effects so you guys can see. Oh, the, yeah. The experience is amazing. I think it's exclusive to Regal Cinemas. Um, but I saw, like, the first movie I saw there was Birds of Prey. And then, like, Sonic came out after that. I saw uh, No Way Home with my entire family, with my little wow. like five-year-old niece. And she was like, oh my God. Like she just felt like Spider-Man swinging through the seats. So uh, if you have a 4DX theater, go see uh, Godzilla Minus One in 4DX. Man, I'm a little jealous not- right now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited in to see if there's any regals near me. Yeah, definitely. And, and Tuesdays, if you're a regal club member, you pay like, I think normally those tickets are 20 bucks. You pay like 15 or something. Ooh, okay. 
normally I, I do Dolby because I think that's like kind of, I mean, we have IMAX, we don't have like the legit like 70 millimeter, you know, uh, IMAX, but uh, we got the Dolby, which is just like really insane, incredible audio quality that just like makes the seats rumble every time it Godzilla stomps or roars. And I enjoy that. That feels cool. Um, but the 4DX, that sounds insane. Yeah, they have like, it, they do all everything, like when it snows, like if it's like, uh, like cold, like that uh, frost, what did you call that earlier? That frost uh, kaiju, they would like mm. put fans on you. So you literally have to bring a jacket. I tell my family members, if you get cold, like you're going to feel like you're in the Arctic. So <laughs> they will immerse in the movie or whatever. That's awesome. Yeah. I dig, that's cool, man. Definitely what right. was the first movie you said you saw in 40x uh it was actually birds of prey and and you probably you were probably like oh no that's probably not a good one but the, you know the scene where she uh infiltrates the police station and there's like she uses a gas gun and yeah smoke so with the pink and the blue smoke they filled the entire auditorium with smoke and so made it to where when she comes out of the smoke, the actual smoke was on either side of the screen, so it looked like she was coming through the screen. Oh it was my gosh. So cool to witness that cinematically uh, different effect. It's a gimmick, you know, but they yeah. do it so well. So it's definitely worth the price of admission. In my opinion, it's like going to Disney World and, kind of, and having a good time. Dang, that sounds epic. Yeah, I just, I just found it yesterday. So I was like looking, I was like, oh, Beyonce book, Beyonce book. Okay, Beyonce book. Oh, Tuesday's open and Godzilla's there. <laughs> so oh, Godzilla. man. Well, hey, if you can find 40X guys, freaking do it. That sounds amazing. I, I'll try to give my little review on the next show when I catch you guys. Yeah, I dig that. You'll, you'll have to let us know uh, when we have you on next. How is uh, the Beyonce? Because is that in 40X as well? No, I think that's that's in Dolby. Uh, so I'm sure okay. that Toho actually. I mean, because Beyonce, they don't you don't really need to like have moving mm -hmm. seats and all that. I guess it would be cool. Yeah. But I guess Toho, the deal was they they got those uh, screens, but uh, she's got a lot of the Dolby ones also. Nice. Okay. Well, they, they, at least they they know the priorities here. Like Godzilla is more you know for hey. that type of viewing. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Corey, who all do we have in the chat today? They they seem lively. Man, yeah, it's they're coming in hot today. We got a bad fanatic in the house, crazy, crazy Craig Rowland, uh, King Donkey Kong, Oracle of Clock Tower, the Butler, hashtag restore the Snyderverse guy. We got Brogu in the house, we have Trevor H in the house. Brogu also said th thank you for um modding him, and I know uh, uh, you modded somebody else, uh, I think, um. Kaisha Crazy Craig, and he said thank you as well. We have Jim Marco coming yeah. in. That's 3 a.m. as well. Hashtag restore the Snyderverse guy. The Batman who laughs. We have Qatar Law in the house. A Bat Dan. My boy Red Hooded Outlaw. What's we up, have buddy? a lot of people filing in as we speak. Mr. Samayam, Carrie Kelly, Oracle's Clock Tower, of course, always saying she loves Queen B. I think I got everybody. People are following in as we speak. Thank you so much. The butlers in here. Hmm, man, I, I like I, I I got like sidetracked, Trey. I was uh, literally looking up like Regal and 4D. Where where's the closest? <laughs> Trying to see if you can find something. Yeah, it's probably gonna be Denver, buddy. Like so. Hey, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Might be making a drive. You, you got to do what you got to do, you know, for right. the, the best quality, you know, see it on the biggest screen possible. It's like Rebel Moon. You got to you got to see it mm -hmm. in the best, you know, possible mm -hmm. screen. It's kind of like Christopher Nolan. You know, if you don't see those films in IMAX or like in Dolby or something that's mm -hmm. better than a standard theater quality, then you're kind of missing out on what I mean. Home theater systems have gotten so good that you kind of have to see those better quality you know, theater experiences to really enjoy the film for what it is, you know. So that, that definitely don't waste your time. Just go for it. Uh, Gianmarco, my man, thank you so much for being here still at 3 a.m. I'm just glad you're here. And I, I know you probably have a lot to discuss. He says the cinema I will go to has the XL theater poor version of IMAX that I believe is also Dolby, but they did not uh, put minus one in that theater. Uh, oh, what did it say, Great, Because of what? Because it's only because one... Oh. Per day. Yeah. Only one screening? I can't believe they're doing that. That's crazy. Yikes. Well, you know, maybe if it if it blows up, if it's sold out, maybe you can push the, the theater to encourage them to do some more showings. Cause I think in the US at least, 
it's just right time you know monarch is a big popular show right now it's been number one on apple tv the last two weeks um going against some real tough competitors too on apple it's even i know ted lasso has been out for a while but it's it's doing some really good numbers uh and so far is like one of the highest rated MonsterVerse content out there right now according mm. to like Rotten Tomatoes IMDB so mm. people seem to really be enjoying it so that makes me happy I, I just I'm excited you know to talk about this particular episode because there's some crazy things going on with it uh, we have a lot to discuss guys so like I said if you haven't already share this stream get your friends in the chat because there's there's a big theory that uh, will might blow your minds a little bit or at least i would love to hear your guys's including my panel's opinions mm. on it but uh, are you guys do you guys want to just jump right into it and just mm. get right in i'm ready i'm so ready. Ready. i agree but Corey, i feel like we should probably put uh we do have a sponsor as you guys already know we have to put in our, our special messaging and uh Corey, can you go ahead and play uh that special message from our sponsors which one this one <laughs> and now a special message brought to you by the titan preparedness plan with the recent spike in titan sightings circulating on social media proactive preparation for a titan emergence event is crucial a single towering force of nature has the potential to forever alter the lives of millions it is our mission to help you prepare for that force the titan preparedness plan is your guide to staying safe in the face of monsters these are the three steps you need to know one know before you go Identify the location of your nearest Titan shelter and practice navigating a Titan evacuation route with your family on a weekly basis. Two, run and take cover. In the case of a Titan emergence, calmly sprint to the nearest Titan shelter. If your designated shelter is inaccessible or at capacity, seek the basement or lowest floor of a nearby building. Three, stay informed. Follow any further instruction from local authorities and stay informed using your mobile device, television, or radio. We can't stop a Titan emergence, but we can safeguard our lives. Join us in building a safer, more resilient community. We are here to protect you. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to the Titan Preparedness Plan for taking care of us and sponsoring tonight's episode. You know, we just want you guys to be safe out there. You never know when the next Titan attack is going to happen. We, we want to stop another G day. So just, you know, prepare yourselves, you know, follow the steps, you know what to do, but uh, thank you to TPP. Yeah. For, uh, I, I feel for... safe. Uh, I actually just recently purchased a nuke. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I, I'm ready to uh, operation lucky dragon, some shit. Operation. Yeah. You think that'll help you? <laughs> I mean, Godzilla had a big smile on his face. It was like, it was snack time. He was like, Thanksgiving. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, give me the turkey here. <laughs> oh my God. Just uh, kidding. You know, the government's probably watching right now. They're like, yeah, hey, what did you just word, say? Corey, Monarch is already on their way to yeah. get you. You're, you're done, you know. <laughs> I appreciate it, Broger. Yeah, you, you definitely want to follow those instructions. I, I'm about uh, I'm about 20% sure they'll work for you. <laughs> but uh, guys, let's go ahead and get into this episode titled Secrets and Lies. And for a good reason, and I really loved kind of the theme of this particular episode with Secrets and Lies. Um, but it kicks us off right where we left off, you know, when they find um, Kurt Russell's character, Lee Shaw. He, he's basically giving the rundown, like, hey, here's the plan. Like, we're going to go try to find your father, Hiroshi. Uh, but clearly there we're being tracked down by monarch you know th this is a monarch facility to keep us all quiet and you know stuck here because we know too much which is a very interesting theme now that titans are out there got, i mean there's no hiding it after post g day that titans and monsters exist but it kind of leads you to believe that there is something more that monarch is holding on to that they don't want the rest of the public to know about which is interesting because as we saw in Godzilla King of the Monsters, which takes place, I think, four years after where we are currently right now. Uh, so 2019, they kind of they're in the spotlight, you know, they're being questioned by the government. And even then, you know, they're kind of being secretive about where they have certain outposts. Obviously, we know eventually they'll find Ghidorah's outpost in uh, Antarctica. But obviously, with their plan to bust out, track down Hiroshi, uh, there was something that happened uh, that I get the feeling, and, and we talked about this, and I think during a watch party in our episode one and two discussion, 
that there seems to be a bit of a love triangle going on with our legacy cast, you know, with Lee Shaw, Bill Randa, um, and Dr. Kiko, uh, because just of the way he's reacting a lot. Uh, but Lee Shaw says to Kate that Hiroshi was more than a son to me than a nephew. And I get the sense, even though he lost, you know, Bill Randa is technically his father. Do you think, theory-wise, is there any way that Lee Shaw is possibly Hiroshi's real, true father? I could see. Because I, I rewatched the episode like you, Trey, and paid attention to, like, add subtitles on. And when that, you're talking about that exchange when they're initially, I think they're on the boat, right? And uh, I think this particular scene where he mentions that Hiroshi was more of a uh, a son than you know than a nephew to him was. Um, oh, sorry, Corey, I know I'm messing up your theme. Uh, let's see if I can bring it up. It was it was this particular scene here when they're trying to bust out of the Monarch facility. Yeah, and then later on when they're on the plane, he does bring up like he makes it. He makes something like. He says something he references uh uh the mom the mom's name is uh, uh kiko. kiko uh yep the way he references her like oh you know you, you should see your grandmother drive or and then he references her on the plane and it's like uh he, he was like his mother la 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 i did kind of sense the way it was written that dialogue delivery kind of confused me the first time i heard it because i heard i was just like oh this is the father right like yeah Kermito is the shaw is the father um and then i rewatched it again and i'm like the dialogue does make the distinction but the delivery like you're talking about it's kind of like to me is what kind of is has me feeling like even if he's not the father he's just like very paternal over hiroshi so mm -hmm. i did kind of get that sense i don't know about super bro Corey, but yeah, no, at first when he said that, I, that's immediately where my head went. I was like, oh, shit, maybe he's actually daddy, you know? And uh, um, what, what I was kind of, when I rewatch it and everything like that, I, th I think there's a possibility there, Trey, but I'm going to lean more towards that uh, Bill Randa is still uh, the father. But just like we saw in uh, the original Godzilla uh, 2014 film, uh, after the passing of his wife, uh, he goes kind of crazy and tries to figure out more about these kaijus. I'm wondering if, obviously, Bill Randa still does go down that line. Maybe uh, Shaw becomes more of that father figure that's there mm, for... Kind of takes that uh, responsibility, yeah. especially after losing his mom. And then eventually, we do yeah. know that the, the relationship between Bill Randa and Hiroshi was strange. You know, kind of uh, strange because of I, I think his father got focused on kind of from the footage that we saw on, you know, the first episode with Skull Island when Bill Rando was running away from the mother long legs. He kind of even references like, hey, like, you know, I know you probably wouldn't care if I did die, uh, but like maybe I can leave something for you. So you could tell that after so many years, they, they got out of touch. You know, they weren't speaking to each other, um, which could explain why Lee Shaw kind of took over and you know mm -hmm. felt some sort of responsibility for him uh gian marco says again there's clearly been a love triangle between shaw kiko and billy so it might be a possibility i just feel like there's something going on there there's a there's a bit of drama they haven't hinted at and i feel like they're leading on to a giant reveal that they're gonna find out that freaking lee shaw is like the grandfather or something you know yeah. these kids um which is why he might even feel a bit of paternalness towards them in a way um but uh, let's see it would explain hiroshi and his second family oh yeah kind of following <laughs> the things that his father done is a natural genetic kind of tendency in them maybe i don't know it's kind of an interesting thought never thought of it that way um but when they finally take this opportunity they're they're going to go on this journey they're going to go try to find hiroshi uh they're, they're busting out of this monarch thing. And I one thing I loved about this particular car breakout scene is the simple fact of <laughs> you, you clearly get this nice dynamic of the older generation versus the younger generation where he's like, where's the key? You know, and they're like, well, you never drove before. And he's like, I can drive. It's just like, where's how do I turn it on? Uh, 
it was just a, a very nice dynamic that adds a bit of comedic flavor. But I also think in a way for Godzilla fans, it kind of helps like reflect us a little bit as a as a fandom. You know, you have the original fandom, the very older generation that you know watched all the Shawa era you know, in the Heisei era, and now you got this newer generation with the legendary stuff going on, uh, that it, it kind of reflected us in a way that's something that we could all kind of connect to, uh, at least in a piece of the fandom. Uh, what did you guys think about that super cool transition between going from Kurt Russell to his son, Wyatt Russell? I just thought, I mean, it helps when you have someone that looks like you, like your son, but I just felt like that. What a cool way to kind of fade into that, you know? Yeah, Super Bros. Corey's face during y'all's watch party was told it all. Like <laughs> he was just like, "Yeah, that's awesome!" <laughs> like I, I rewatched you guys, but uh, yeah, that moment was was like they they did such a great job. Not only, in my opinion, just like showing you Shaw as a badass still um, at. 90 something years old <laughs> mm -hmm. like talking about the genetics we might need to go into that theory a little bit there might be something going on with his genetics so uh mm -hmm. but uh but also just you know the watching the second time around the mannerisms that uh why it just does so well like the the inflection like mm -hmm. the uh and the voice the tone just the way the body language um that shot was just amazing uh super bro Corey, like I, when I saw it, I was like, that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was such a sick transition, right? Like, and, you know, it's obviously makes it easier when uh, your son out there transitioning to as a younger you. So it, it mm -hmm. looks like just like them. It was one of the coolest trans, you know, I, I, you know, we're content creators. We edit a lot. So we're always trying to think of cool transitions. And I, yeah, that like really got me really excited. So. Right. I mean, it, just from a technical standpoint, you're mm -hmm. like, brilliant. That like so yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, you know, and like I said, why not use that? You knew the moment they casted the two that mm -hmm. they would be able to play with some fun themes like that. But uh, I would like to kind of break down this episode in a, in a way of doing kind of what I'm going to call the legacy timeline, the Monarch legacy timeline with the, the trio of Lee Shaw, Bill Randa, and Dr. Kiko. Um, it, they, we start off with this like really great scene, right? With Lee Shaw set up a meeting with General Puckett, who is the one that's put him on this task, you know, to, to keep an eye on these eggheads, uh, these scientists who are running this thing from Monarch. Uh, and he's he's basically giving them the lowdown that like, hey, we found something. You know, he did his report back, and we need we need more. We need more funding because there's something out here that we cannot explain, and it is ginormous. And of course, they show us this wonderful giant footprint mold of Godzilla's footprint. And you're just, I mean, I just love how this show. Anytime Godzilla's mentioned, referenced in any way even though it's not a Godzilla show, right? It's not called Godzilla Legacy of Monsters. It's called Monarch. So you can kind of reference that Godzilla is just kind of a, a cameo character that when his presence and his appearance is there, it's it's a treat for us. But I just love how they know that, they are aware of that, and anytime he's referenced, you hear him, you see something of him, it gives you chills. Do you guys get chills like like that anytime there's just a little bit of that Godzilla little little oh. season? Oh yeah. This 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 show goes to show you that expression like less is more. Like they really um took the care. I don't I don't know how much they collaborated with like Toho or whatnot, but they really do build you up and so those moments hit you in the fields like for me like when you do hear the first i guess the sonar starts picking them up and you you know you just start to hear those old like those just just tones and and seeing the footprint you you really just get the you can visualize right like you can visualize godzilla there and just like how small and how much of a chance we don't have against it <laughs> yeah so when the general when general puckett sees that and he's just like my god like you're, you're right you know like I think that's just shocks you and out of uh, apathy or just like your yeah. little hardened soldier 
uh, sense that you got, but uh, absolutely, yeah, but, that's that's a great way to to put it. And uh, I loved what uh, Gian Marco also said. General Puckett is playing uh, the same role of General MacArthur in Godzilla Awakening. Yes, from uh, the the soft canon comic now. They, and we'll we'll kind of go into that a little further in the comics. Uh, it's actual and actually General MacArthur who is you know setting all these task force and helping out with Monarch rather than this General Puckett. Uh, but it's I'm I'm okay that they've they've kind of you know did a little of their own thing. It, for me as a I have a little bit of an issue just in terms of switching that piece off because it's kind of like they're in the same universe. It's supposed to be legendary comics monster verse, so I have to like kind of remember like hey it's soft canon. It doesn't have to be exactly what the comics. Do you know was. for sure that they switched will, roles? Because um, the General MacArthur was he the first general that was told about you know these? He General MacArthur is the one that gave Lee Shaw the, the funding. The, well, the mission, and he's kind of he's the one that's showing up in a lot of these hmm. places like Operation Lucky Dragon. I mean, okay. I guess you could say General Puckett was always there around somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it just kind of seems like if MacArthur was there, then there's no point in Lee Shaw speaking to. Pocket, you know, he might as well go to him and be like, I need the funding for this, you know, see, because they kind of mentioned that, right? When he's just like, Hey, I know, like, you're a one star general, you probably had to go up three levels. And he's like, I had to go up five levels, you know, which probably means at some point he had to speak to General MacArthur and the president, you know, about getting that nuclear bomb. But, you know, it's, 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 it's soft cannon, right? They, they kind of switch some things up and we'll, we'll go into it a little further. Um, where were we? Uh, so Corey, I think did did you did you say what you thought about um, just that whole opening scene with the the scientists and the the army? I don't know if I interrupted you. And in... about me? Yeah. No, I haven't said anything about that yet. I, I loved it. You know, uh, obviously uh, seeing General Puckett. You know, like curiosity and like you know, like what the heck's going on here, and then kind of being scared of just a footprint. You know, it was uh, ju just a um, overall cool uh, interaction with them, and uh, leads up to some really cool scenes later on. Oh, absolutely, and and I think you brought up something really great, Josh, just in terms of the differences between. And this is kind of like an ongoing theme for Godzilla, where you get the the scientist aspect of it. Like even in the first Godzilla 1954 Gojira film, you know the military is very much like they feel threatened. You know, there's this giant creature out there that we just we got to take him out. We got to annihilate. It's a threat to our existence. And then you got the scientists who are kind of like, no, Godzilla needs to be studied. There's something like we could mess up the ecosystem if we get rid of this guy. We have no idea what his purpose on this planet is we need to do more research. We're not saying he's not a threat that we shouldn't, you know, look into this, but we don't know enough about Godzilla. You know, we just know at this point, probably fairy tales, you know, the old um, fables of Godzilla at this point, some of the cave drawings, maybe and mm -hmm. the legends that he has created around different villagers. You know, he's probably a God. It's probably very much like what they did in the first Godzilla, where there was that Island that used to sacrifice people mm -hmm. to godzilla to keep the angry god at bay um it probably was something similar to that right. um yeah. but it would make sense if it was godzilla are we talking about the footprint i, I think yeah. it's pretty i think it's i think it's godzilla it would be weird if they said it was something else but it maybe you could be right maybe there's something out there that would rival godzilla even at that time but of course seeing such a giant footprint they're like we need a we can help you find this creature. And of course, Lee Shaw knows what the general wants, right? He knows how he thinks. The military's bronze. They're, you know, they're the strength, the, you know, the fighting material rather than, you know, the think tank, like the scientists are, you know, but they're like, we can lure the creature and learn more about him with 150 pounds of uranium. And once again, this is some of the details. There's so many great small details in the show where when they mentioned this 150 pounds of uranium and the general's like, well, that's the same amount that we use to blow up Hiroshima, you know, Hiroshima. And of course you get a reaction from Dr. Kiko about that mm -hmm. because to her, that means something. And mm -hmm. I just loved that they paid attention to those details that 
while while the general pocket he's clearly just a military guy just hard ass he doesn't think about you know sensitivity to those things and and, and he can't even reference that when he's just like oh hello miss and she's like i'm a doctor you know that like don't like try to treat me different because i'm a woman and i'm from japan you yeah. know uh he, he kind of and he, he kind of gets taken back by that and i love that because shaw knows he had that similar experience where he thought this woman was hitting on him in episode one but it ended up being the scene of like or episode two sorry uh where you know it was like oh like all right i understand we're not gonna do this pissing contest here you're clearly gonna win this battle and i respect you for it the general has a bit of a different taste to it right um wh what did you guys think of that particular dynamic between the the general pocket lee shaw and uh dr kiko it was interesting because uh definitely like you had said the uh with, with shaw and uh uh, Kiko, that that ice had been broken, you know, and they they felt each other out, and uh, his uh, male biases were checked, you know, and yeah, she, uh, and so that's something that was uh, so funny to see when you know he was kind of coaching them like, hey, okay, this is what we got to do. Do y'all just want to be uh, you know little monster hunters, or do y'all want to you know have this actually? mean something you know we got to have the funding so this is what we got to do and so she you can tell on her body language and her expression she's kind of like oh, i gotta play this you know but at the same time she's not gonna you know let anybody step all step on under her over her uh calling her miss she's like it's doctor and he's like, oh my 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 apologies you know <laughs> yeah place uh so it was cool seeing them what the great thing about this whole legacy sequence and what we'll get to it more later but just to see that that bond has been solidified and that trust hmm. from what they have went through and so you really see that play out and i love that because they they have their own little you know their little side team kind of it's their inner circle and they're using the military for their own means and i kind of like to see that 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 trust and that bond solidified yeah yeah no it's 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 uh i do like that about that too you could tell they're a very close group you know, and I, I like that chemistry between the trio. Well, what's up, Sky? It's good to see you, man. <laughs> right? Josh is always rocking the, the dope shirts, even uh, when he was with us last time. It's always it's always yeah. good when you know. <laughs> I do love that shirt. It's, it's one of my favorite ones of the new cell. Yes. Shirt. Which I think they're oh, on uh, Ain't the People. Uh, yeah. Slash, mm -hmm. uh, ZSJ. I, I think they're available now, too, that you can get some of the money goes to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So you guys, you guys know, just go help out, get a cool T-shirt in the process and, you know, send money to a good cause. What, what better way than that? I love being to the people. They always have the greatest stuff. Um, Broger says, I think it was Godzilla that brought the ship to the island. Godzilla has a habit of swimming underneath ships. And I think that ship got caught onto his spine and went along for the ride. Oh, you're talking about... Uh, the uh, USS Lawton when uh, the Ion Dragon uh, makes its home once it makes landfall. That's an interesting mm. thought. Maybe, I don't know. That's that's a curious idea. That's interesting. I, I kind of dig that. Um, as we, I think someone asked about the teleport. Uh, did I read that? No? Okay. Um, Maybe I thought I read something about it. Um, the oh, teleportation. The Teleportation, yeah, yeah, the teleportation theory that uh, uh, Bill Randa has. He keeps do, have you guys noticed that he keeps bringing it up and he keeps getting shut down about it? Like, he's like, dude, this is not the time, it's outlandish. You're like, uh -huh. you're totally gonna lose the general here. I feel like they're setting something up to that. Uh, yeah. this isn't quite the theory I want to talk about. Uh, you know, that's the big one, but I feel like with this sub theory. There's something there's something going on with this teleportation. They're either referencing that Godzilla or these kaijus are using the hollow earth uh, teleportation, you know, holes, you know, uh, forget what they're calling them. The caves or, or tunnels that they're having where they can travel through the earth really quickly uh, to get to places. They're either talking about that or there's some maybe there is a kaiju out there that has that ability of teleportation which is crazy, but I, I, I get the sense that this teleportation theory is going to come up at some point and it's going to be kind of a gotcha moment with Bill Randa and Lee Shaw saying, like, I told you, you tried to shut me down on this. What's, what's your guys' thoughts about this teleportation theory that Bill Randa keeps having? You want to go, Corey? Since I yeah, I think, uh, I think you're right, Trey. I, uh, 
I think uh, there was uh, one point where Shaw uh, compared it to the flat earth conspiracy theory. So uh, he's trying to play it down so much that, uh, yeah, it would I wouldn't be surprised if they hit us with a shocker or he's like partially right or something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How about you, Josh? I agree. Uh, just actually uh, this episode now watching it a second time in that line, we're, we're, we're wondering, right? We, we were theorizing what was on the footage. Like, what what is on these tapes that that uh, Bill Randa, John Goodman had on Kong Skull Island, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and just because of, like, scheduling and whatnot, I kind of started, you know, I'm on the show with you guys. I kind of started to see, oh, it's 10 episodes. And I see that, it, okay, this show is going on until next year. Oh, there's a, there's a Godzilla Kong movie coming out next year. Oh, okay. So then my mind started wandering, and 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 so I watched the episode a second time, and then I like kind of like refreshed my mind on Hollow Earth, right? Um, so I'm kind of thinking like you're onto something, Trey. Is that I think Bill Randa kind of is is more knowledgeable of, of the Hollow Earth and how to get around, possibly. Like maybe he has some kind of like footage of a creature or or Kong or something mm. going one of these portals or whatever they're called black holes as we see yeah. in Godzilla versus Kong um because I was thinking about the timeline right like, there's so much that we got to fill in the gaps between Godzilla 2014 King of the Monsters in 2019 and then I think it's five years after where Godzilla Kong happens or something. yeah I think I think it is another five years that or it's like five to seven <laughs> years something like that yeah and Monarch has established Oh, transportation systems like they're they're getting oh back. yeah apex with their their hollow earth uh traveler ship yeah, yeah. that was it, it gets so, crazy with all that i feel like i'm just kind of you know theorizing there's got to just be have been shadow work being done you know somehow in hollow earth so i don't know if it's bill randa's footage or something but mm. teleportation line was not just a throwaway line mm-hmm. so i think i definitely think you're on yeah, and I think they've kind of hit at as, as Sin Havoc says, Hollow Earth is basically inner Earth. It's you know kind of the center to the journey, you know, journey to the center of the Earth kind of idea, uh, where there's a whole new realm uh, yeah. beneath our feet, essentially towards the the core of the Earth, where these giant creatures of you know ancient past uh, exist. And it, to me, it kind of does make sense, and I love that people are saying, yeah, it definitely has kind of come out and they're they keep teasing things and they've kind of teased it throughout the monster verse right um where in the first godzilla 2014 they showed monarch footage of caverns and giant caves of these creatures you know dwelled in the the deep and then in kong skull island you learn that bill randa actually reached out to brooks who was played by Corey hawkins because of his hollow earth theory and that Bill Randa had a similar thought, similar theory on that, and he wanted to find a similar mind that could help study that and research it, which is why they dropped the bomb. So Bill Randa was always on some type of path of saying that there is these deep tunnels within the earth that lead to the center, and it, you know, and there's many different tunnels and stuff like that, and they kind of hinted at it quite a bit in Godzilla King of the Monsters um that of brooks's theory and and it became true right and then we saw how it works with godzilla versus kong so my guess is the teleportation theory that bill randa keeps getting shut down on by lee shaw um would tell me that it's, it's probably that it's they're probably hinting at that as teleportation even though it's not it's kind of it is but i don't think it's like as simple as like dragon ball z where you know they show up in some place just by thinking it uh, our boy Skywalker the Jedi giving us a five dollar soup chat. Thank you so much, brother. It's so, Thanks, so yeah. good to see you. Thanks for stopping by, my man. Saying haven't started the show yet. You need to. Uh, just wanted to show some love to the panel and chat. Thanks, brother. It's always good to see you. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe to the platform, my man. Thank you, guys. You already know what to do. Skywalker has been a good friend to our channel. He has a wonderful YouTube show as well, doing a lot of DC and Rebel Moon and Netflix uh, watch parties and. You just need to check out his channel. He's raised a lot of money for AFSP as well. Can't thank him enough for all of his support in that area, especially. And uh, Corey, I think you, you're you going to be doing a watch party soon with Sky? Yeah, it sounds like uh, we're still trying to get it figured out, but uh, 
potentially uh, tomorrow. Uh, um, Godzilla. Um, I'm not, I can't remember which one he said now. Um, yeah, King of the Monsters. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you want to do yeah, a Godzilla King of the Monsters watch party? One of those scenes where I wish I wasn't uh, driving to Arizona mm -hmm. tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> that's totally, like, that's my favorite one of the Monsterverse. I love that movie so much. It's a busy weekend, but I think he wanted to say like four or five something Pacific. Well, make sure you guys yeah. keep it keep an eye out for Skywalker mm -hmm. show there because you should you should definitely hop on, join the watch party, watch King of mm -hmm. the Monsters. It's one of the best Godzilla films ever, I think. But uh, it just you know, have a good time. Enjoy like doing what we do with our watch parties, you know, so have a good time celebrating with fans and all around the genre. And plus the more engagement, these Godzilla and monster verse films get, I think they're going to be more convinced to, you know, do more and more with it. So support success all the way. Corey, can mm. you play my boy sky a little some, some to say, thank you. Oh, you know, it's time to dance, buddy. <laughs> you gotta love that Godzilla victory dance, man. <laughs> and, and because Sky's whole thing was, you know, like and subscribe to the platform, I feel like we just gotta we gotta do it, Corey. We just gotta let remind people what they have to do here. You know, here we go. Godzilla! <laughs> that's so funny man. i love that um, so much the emancipated tj did have a big strain he said my question is the theory so initially when godzilla got exposed to the atomic bomb he went to sleep but increased his power levels mm -hmm. in 2014 the mudos woke him up he, when he get gets exposed to the oxygen bomb i think the bomb regressed his power levels Hence why he retracted to me uh, to uh, the core of the Earth. And then mm -hmm. he says, so my theory is every time Godzilla gets exposed to the atomic bomb, he evolves in his ability to handle it. The next time he gets exposed to it, he won't react like uh, King of the Monsters. He might unlock a new ability. Mm. Oh, so like not his uh, burning Godzilla atomic form that he does in King of the Monsters? Mm. Yeah, it's certainly an interesting uh, thought process there, uh, the TJ. I mean, certainly it's whenever Godzilla comes into contact, and when really any of these Titans come into contact with radiation and nuclear energy, they seem to get stronger. Um, mm. Yeah, with the Mutos, he, he does have a bit of a tough time there, uh, and he does go to sleep for a bit. But as we kind of learn in King of the Monsters, and if you paid attention to the Monarch website, the Monarch Sciences website, where they actually did the whole Godzilla tracking number when they were about to release King of the Monsters, you could see Godzilla was very busy traveling around the world, keeping tabs on the other Titans. Uh, especially King Ghidorah. He, once they discovered King Ghidorah, Godzilla was not a happy camper. He was happy knowing that you know Ghidorah was kind of lost in time, but when they discovered him, he kind of kept a closer eye to see what was going on, which is why he, when, um, I think, is it Jonah? Jonah Taylor? Uh, Aaron, uh, Jonah Taylor, who I think is uh, the colonel, the British colonel, who's mm. kind of the uh, environmentalist, soldier um he uh you know when he is about to release Ghidorah Godzilla tries to alert the humans as Michael Doherty says in behind the scenes he's like Godzilla's trying to tell Monarch and the humans like hey trouble's coming I'm gonna need your help on this one so it's kind of Godzilla's just connection to the world uh and to people and how he's clearly the defender of earth at that time um but yeah it's it's an interesting thought for sure um Let's see. I, I told Broku that every time they drop an H bomb on Godzilla, he just becomes stronger. Yeah, exactly. Which is why he was lured to that bomb, right? With uh, as we talked about earlier, the Operation Lucky Dragon, which is a big thing. Um, in the gut, it's the first time, at least, I guess you'd say, the U.S. Army becomes aware of Godzilla. Really, um, in the comics, Godzilla Awakening, you see that he, you know, they kind of go around and they get an idea that Godzilla exists based off certain things that happens. Like, and this is where I say Godzilla awakening becomes a bit soft canon. 
Uh, let me see, Corey. I think I have a slide on it. Yep, this next one. Um, it becomes a little bit of soft cannon because when the bombs happen in 1945 um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, they, they basically... Godzilla is kind of awakened to it because of this other kaiju called the Shinomura, who is just kind of this like flying dragonfly creature uh, kaiju that Godzilla tries to take out. And they have basically battles all around the Pacific Ocean, these two titans. And that's where Monarch really starts to keep an eye on the two titans. They kind of always see the aftermath of it every now and then get a glimpse of Godzilla because he, you know, they're fighting around ships and stuff like that. So it was, it wasn't quite the like first, first time they saw Godzilla. They knew he existed, but in Monarch, they kind of, this show, they kind of suggested that this is the first time anyone sees him, you know, in full body appearance rather than just the aftermath of Godzilla. So it's kind of a, an interesting change there and of course in the comics with godzilla awakening when they blow up the bomb they they also blow up shinomura which shinomura mm. in this case he doesn't survive the attack godzilla does obviously he gets stronger uh and you can see here that even godzilla looks a little thin compared to his 2014 counterpart because it's 1954 this is basically baby gojira i guess you could say in a way um not quite a, yeah, i mean obviously he's huge uh, i think someone suggested at this point godzilla is i think they said he's a little uh smaller than 300 feet which is what his form is in 2014 um because the the bomb the lucky dragon bomb is actually like 30 feet in the air uh yeah. at that time so yeah i mean there's there's like you said in the Godzilla 2014 film, you barely see him get out of the water when they blow up the bomb. In the you know, Monarch show, he's right next to the bomb. He gets up out of it and he stares at it with a big smile on his face before they blow it up. You know, uh, in Godzilla Awakening, he's chasing another Titan to you know to kill it. Uh, so it's they they've kind of thrown around the story all in different places. So that to me was like the one area where it's like I wish there was a little bit more consistency about what happened, whether if they wanted to completely decanon the comic. Oh, yeah. I'm saying. There, there was a bunch of like, like uh, shots going off. I was like, oh shit, Godzilla's attacking. Oh, is that the fireworks? fireworks going off right outside right now. You get to, get to see it a little bit? Yeah. Oh no. Oh yeah. I kind of, yeah. I can see every down that. I see your green screen too. Kind of, it's like still trying to hold on to the Godzilla yeah. image. Oh, it is. <laughs> so it looks one. like Godzilla's in yeah, the window. Yeah. <laughs> They're fighting Godzilla! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what the hell's going on outside? Oh my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Awesome, like, why is his man. camera like all messed up? Like, Corey, are you alive? Oh shit, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> gosh. That's so funny. What so what did you guys think about seeing Operation Lucky Dragon? How um how the monarch legacy of uh, monster shows handles that iconic moment in 1954? Oh god. I mean uh I just want to jump in real quick because the, uh, like I mentioned earlier, this, this moment, like just seeing the whole sequence slowly, but surely play out. Like just the, the, the soon as you hear, you know, just like the, <laughs> you know, what's coming as, you know, fans of the series and, and fans of the monster verse. Mm. Um, I had to watch this like several times. Uh, and I don't usually watch TV shows like multiple times. Cause I watched it the first time uh and then i watched the sequence the sequence again on youtube and then earlier today i just had to watch the entire episode uh they just did like such a good job uh really make teasing you you know like building it up building us up to that like climb yeah. uh and it's funny that you, you you know you talked about the uh inconsistencies on the watch party so i went back and watched the 2014 cr opening credits and so yeah. you literally like you start to see his snoot or like his his nose come out and then they explode it uh in that sequence but then in here we get to see him all you know torso in his full glory you know it's kind of like that moment where they're like it's such a cool theme it's a cool scene can we we don't need to be consistent here right right 
But and it's because I think you know in 2014 when you're watching that movie for the first time, audiences you know they really wanted to build up that first appearance of Godzilla in that movie, right? So if you see him on footage, it's kind of like eh, okay, we already saw him in the opening sequence. So I'm just gonna chalk it up to that. But yeah. this I didn't really have a problem with because you know seeing that shot going up his scales from his back was just so cool to see just thinking about you know how would a person look on, on like that like he's just enormous um compared to to us as people um i thought they did just like with episode one uh, with that trauma with kate where you get to see him with that trauma on the bridge that she's experienced he he looked great like he looked like a he looked like a baby like people were saying he's a little bit younger you know he's a little different but a little thinner yeah yeah a little yeah, different He's a little, like, the thing I noticed is just like, you know, I like this Godzilla, the minus one Godzilla. I'm like, Ooh, I don't know. Like he's good. He's kind of scary. <laughs> like, like that whole angry beast. But this one is kind of curious. He's like, what's going on here? What are you guys going to be? You know? He's just a kid, you know? So, uh, but this, just seeing, uh, as somebody who, who loved the Oppenheimer movie, um, Seeing the references to Los Almos, almost I think that's how you pronounce it, almost uh, the camp in reference in Oppenheimer, uh, General Puckett op references references that uh, also, mm. and just seeing how the uh, how similar you know those those tests were run back in in the day in the fifties I guess um, with the atomic bomb explosion, uh, it was interesting. It really made me feel, although yes, this is like science fiction fantasy, yeah it put some levity and, and grounded it in our world and just like what it would be like for uh people who you know military personnel to prepare to encounter something like this because they're there to protect us right yeah but they're also there to destroy this you know big mf -er. so <laughs> i uh i thought that they really showed the fear in everyone's eyes uh when you see him uh and also but also just show how Dr. Mura, I think that's her mm -hmm. uh, uh, Yeah, uh, Kiko Mura, I believe. Mura, yeah. You know, she's empathetic to this creature. So you yeah. saw that, like this, like you're saying, the science fiction uh, uh, outlook, uh, I mean, the science aspect of like, you know, this is something ecologically that we might need for our society. And then also the destroy, kill, protect first, ask questions later, militant uh, perspective. Um, but we're all humans at the end of the day, so nobody knows how they're going to react. So I just love seeing the different uh, reactions. It's awesome. I agree. I agree. It was, uh, it, once again, keeping that great consistent theme just kind of known in Godzilla films across the board where science is kind of the, you know, embraces the creature as like, you know, whether he was our mistake, you know, if it was the nuclear origins of Godzilla or just he's an ancient Titan species, there always seems to be that science is kind of like, you know, let him live kind of thing, or we need to study him because he could, he could have something or the research could provide us knowledge that could help the world be better, you know? And then you have the military aspect of it. Like, we're just going to destroy the state, you know, because we got to be the top dogs. We got to be the ultimate species on the planet. Um, you know, and the scenes and you know, whether we like it or not, he is tall. He is big. He's a big boy, you know? things happen as we saw like in san francisco you know like he's things are going to get destroyed you know whether we like it or not and it not might not be on purpose from godzilla but you know he's also we're ants to him you know um cory what was your thoughts about operation uh, lucky dragon dude that was so freaking awesome man i just experienced uh the uh operation lucky dragon again here man that, that was crazy and i appreciate Oracle's clock tower reminding me to uh, follow the TPP. I was about to start taking cover under the, de <laughs> the desk here. Um, no, uh, Operation Lucky Dragon was so cool, man. It was probably one of my favorite sequences throughout episode three. Um, never knew what Operation Lucky Dragon was until you recently told us, Trey, and uh, it was amazing. Like, uh, it's exactly what I expect from the U.S. You know, government. You know, like let, we're, we're going to nuke this thing. Like, let's, yeah. you know, let, 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 let's drop this thing. You know, they they wanted the same amount of uh, hydrogen as uh, 
uh, that was dropped in Tokyo, you know, in Japan recently. Okay, yeah, we'll give it to we'll give it to him in shape of a bomb, man. Mm-hmm. That was so awesome. It was cool seeing Godzilla show up. It was awesome seeing him mm-hmm. get blown up. It was uh, very, you know, like I, I remember, it was like, oh man, this is gonna be better than I'm. <laughs> we got Godzilla background right now. You're joking, <laughs> you know, joking, uh, joking about it, but. Um, yeah, it was it was it was cool because it played at both uh, both you know uh, tugged at both you know strings of your heart you know because one yeah absolutely the uh, the scared and the uh, like holy crap this thing needs to be destroyed before it, you know accidentally messes it up but also you don't want to see you know them to kill Godzilla either so it's like it, it definitely did a good job in balancing of tugging yeah we need to blow this thing up and yeah maybe we should study it a little bit more so. The dynamic there all around was just really, really impressive. And, uh, um, I, you know, I, for an Apple TV show, bro, that atomic bomb going off was pretty sick, man. Yeah, dude. Talking? I mean, for, I mean, I, I don't know what the budget was for this show, but they, they've really spared no expense with it. It's been pretty, pretty great all around. And, um, I, I just loved what the, that whole scene was, you know, once again, referencing godzilla anytime they can using the the it almost like whale sounds as we kind of talked about it on our watch party where it's just it gave you chills for this moment we all knew it was coming up because of the 2014 godzilla film but to kind of see the extended cut of it i guess you could say um was just like such a surreal moment and we all know that it doesn't kill godzilla but it's kind of that like how crazy would that be when they find out at some point when Godzilla is still alive, you know, if, if they find out, well, I mean, we'll see like, once again, how canon they stick to the and how consistent, because technically we don't see Godzilla for, you know, quite some time, you know, not until 2014, he doesn't appear again. Um, you know, he's just kind of gone back into legend. So what maybe they'll help us answer, like, where is Godzilla at this time? Does he go back to his temple uh, you know, to rest, you know, and to regain his energy from the, the nuclear blast and deal with the evolution of changes that he goes through. I and don't know. They, it's kind of an interesting thought. And they just saw him again in 2014. So do, do they even know for sure that this is the same, you know, Godzilla in their eyes? This is the first time they saw it. And then they didn't see it again until 2014. That is an interesting thought. I've, I have seen a few people say that on social media of like, is this the same Godzilla that we see in 2014? My guess is the oh, answer is, is yes, mm-hmm. uh, that it is the same Godzilla. Um, but it's possible that it's certainly possible that mm-hmm. it's not because as we've learned in Godzilla Awakening and Godzilla King of the Monsters mm-hmm. uh, and in Godzilla versus Kong, there used to be a whole giant family of Godzillas. You know, mm-hmm. um, there was Dagon uh, who was the first Godzilla that was killed by the Mudos that planted its eggs, its spores in Godzilla so that they could feed off his radiation. Um, and then there was, of course, uh, another Godzilla, I think, that also died from a Mudo. And some, you know, obviously mm-hmm. from the war between Kongs and Godzilla, you know, they had a giant fight. And there's lore out there that Godzilla and Kong once teamed up a long time ago to fight this flying space creature that we haven't seen yet. So that maybe may pop up in Godzilla Kong, you know, the new empire, but who knows? Um, thank you so much. Sin Havoc. We appreciate dude uh, saying uh, like, share and subscribe to the bad channel. You already know, you know, just, just do it because you guys know what they're talking about. Uh, Brogu says, can we get a jet Jaguar movie where he is the main character and maybe have Godzilla in the end come and help him fight an enemy monster. I'd be down if Netflix wanted to do like a, you know, one of their anime things that that would be cool. I'd, I'd see that uh, people fear what they don't understand. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a ton of that. Uh, but like someone said, because this mission, I guess you could say was successful and in a way Godzilla was kind of collateral damage, but yet got them the proof and the funding they needed to have the blank check for Monarch to become the, you know, the secret society that we all know about, like how we're, uh, you know, how was Monarch able to have all these outposts and do all these scenes and stay under the radar? What's well, because basically they they got the money and the badge that says they can do whatever they want and no one questioned them. I mean, who knows if how powerful Monarch really got? Did did the president even have the ability to question them or the heads of the military? Were they even able to keep up with Monarch? Or once again, is that idea of and I love this because this theme comes back around, right? 
Secrets and Lies, where Lee Shaw tells them, hey, I have like I have a role here. I have to report back to my general, to my superior officer. But you tell me what you want me to know, and that's what I can report him. So if you keep a secret that I'm not told, then that's not a lie. It's just a secret. The difference between secrets and lies, which comes up. And I trust that you'll tell me everything that I need to know. Exactly. I, I, yeah. I love that, man. That was such a, ain't that the truth, you know? Like, only tell me what I need to know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it just shows, and once again, they're building up to that love triangle, right? Because Lee Shaw, when Bill Rand is like, come on, like, you trust, well, Kiko says, you trust us. And, of course, Lee Shaw gives Bill Rando that look like, I still don't trust you. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you're just a dude that popped up out of the jungle for weird reasons and was searching for Titans. Like, how do I trust you? Uh, and, you know, of course, Bill Rando, he's smart enough to go, okay, I know you don't trust me. Do you trust her? We, you know, they both look at her. You know, she's she's the one in between them, uh, keeping them, you know, together in a sense. Um, so I, I love that when he's like, okay, yeah, I, I trust her and this is what I'm going to do for her. I think we're, we're going to see some more of their relationship unfold as we get further into the episodes. Um, but let's see, TJ says, so why in the Kong movie, they said they were running out of money. Um, well, that's, that's, it could be for the simple fact that after years and years of having a blank check and monsters and Titans aren't you know, coming up anymore, maybe because Bill Randa is keeping it a secret, which, and, and here's the thing too, this is where I talk about, there's a little bit of continuity errors here, and maybe it'll be explained a little better. Obviously Kiko keeps, must be keeping the other Titans a secret. It's why she said, do we have to tell the military about all the other Titans or because they're just going to kill them, right. you know? So it's why they keep it a secret. So if you're not producing, you know, the whole idea of Monarch was to track down these creatures and in the military's eyes, destroy them, you know? And if they're not saying any other kaijus are coming up, other titans, you know, these other creatures, and they're just become a data-driven group, which is what we learned they do, um, you know, it could be for the simple fact that, you know, they're losing money because they're not producing any type of new information. We just have that 1954 one-off creature that caused problems for us. Um, but where I say there's a bit of continuity error in it as well is, and once again, it could be because Dr. Kiko, as we learned in the first episode, she dies where he really turns. But I, it seemed a bit interesting to me that Bill Rando wasn't in full agreement with how the military handled this. Like, clearly he has that same motive to be like, we need to share to the world that monsters is, exist you know there's titans out there there's a, a creature that can wipe us all out if it wanted to and where he kind of keeps that you know same thought process like we need to destroy these things you know he's kind of on the side of samuel jackson's character uh colonel tackett um but in the show he kind of seems more you know like maybe sympathetic to kiko's reaction of godzilla being destroyed so that was a bit weird to me because it, it seemed to me when the first attack happened on the USS lawn, Shaw was very much like these things are evil. We need to destroy them. And if we keep our heads in the sand, they're going to take the world back and we can't allow that, mm -hmm. you know? So it was, that's the only part that like, it, he seems a little too uh, calm about the situation. I think he would have been kind of more headstrong about like, Nope, blow it up, blow that creature up. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we'll see that unfold a little more too as time goes on maybe i don't know um do you guys have any thoughts about that kind of that that bit of continuity era of bill randa how he's kind of he's not so gung-ho about wipe them all out yeah no i just kind of the one thing that that that, that it is a little like re-watching it back um about the show that does confuse me like if you don't pay attention to the dates you know because we're dealing with like skip but, you know, we're, yeah. we're still with the cliffhanger from episode one. We're talking about, you know, with her falling and not seeing the outcome with those bed bugs. Um, so for me, I honestly didn't really have too much of a thought of it until you kind of contextualize like, oh, we are, you know, in a time when maybe we should 
I don't know. He he should be a little bit more not go with the flow or go with the plan, mm-hmm. as, as it were. Um, so the one like thing that I can see for for audience people, if they're not familiar with the MonsterVerse or whatnot, maybe the dates they say them like they they do, but there there's like little things that they do or like two years after the Philippines and is where they you know talk about Operation Lucky Dragon. And I was like, oh well, when was the Philippines? You know, I was just kind of in my mind trying to remember so uh yeah i didn't really think about it too much i don't know if Corey did but yeah no i i can't take like yeah sure he could be like that but i think she's kind of softening him up some in a lot of ways she cares mm-hmm. about them he clearly likes her so his yeah. gun home mentality of kill them all you know maybe when he first started looking into them uh, have definitely softened up since she's trying to clearly save or protect them. Yeah. And it's why, and, and like, I'm not so like bent out of shape about it. To me, it's just kind of like an interesting that we haven't quite seen that side of him. Um, just because that's kind of what I was expecting out of his character. But I think you guys, if anything, you're probably right that she's the one softening him up and it could be her death that sets him back on that trail of, I need to discover these things and destroy them. Yeah. You know, sure. um, law says the fact that, uh, the two Randy kids consider her as their grandma makes you to think, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's clear that she is the, the grandma. Um, the question would just be who, who, who's the baby daddy? Who the dad? <laughs> uh, maybe they might have eaten her cause she's full of radiation. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting thought. That's an interesting thought that they've been around radiation enough to to be a part of that. But, hey, they get the funding. Monarch is now on their new set path of, you know, becoming the organization that we all know them to be eventually in the future. Um, Maybe we'll see a young Sarazawa join them at some point. That would be pretty Mm -hmm. cool. I would love to see a cameo of him. Um, But I'm just loving their, you know, the legacy timeline all the way through. I mean, anytime you get to see G man, it's, it's so good. I love it. Just give me more Godzilla and uh, I'm, I'm happy, but uh, I don't think he has to be in every episode. It's just, when you see him, it's a cherry on top. It's a little treat for the fans. I feel like, but uh, let's go ahead, Corey, and let's talk about the main timeline. Now our post G day with our, our new group. Um, so as we know, these guys, they're, they're on the search for their father, Hiroshi, who went somewhere missing uh, during his plane flight that supposedly crashed in Alaska. And I love, once again, all these details that they're talking about. You know, we kind of get this whole yin and yang relationship between her and her brother, uh, Kentaro, mm-hmm. uh, Kate's brother, step half brother, however, yeah, half brother, I guess it would be. Um, because obviously she's very much on the side that her father is scum of the earth, you know. Uh, or at least she's telling herself that her daddy was never there for her. Clearly some daddy issues there. And then you come from the other side of admiration for his father, that he believes his father would be a good man, maybe made a mistake here and lived with it, you know? Um, but both sides are, are the opposite reactions of how they're handling <clears throat> the situation of their father's second secret family. Um, and I think that's, I love that throughout those two are always in, in a way they kind of have wear different colors that are opposites. Like he tends to wear black, she wears white. They're always mm-hmm. standing, you know, between each other. There's even some yin yang imageries that you see there with like some of the artwork behind them. Like there's a black flower, uh, on one side and a white flower, you know, they kind of, they're teasing the imagery to constantly tell you that these two are opposites of each other which I think in turn they're as Cody said on our, one of our watch parties and discussions where eventually they're, they're coming together. They're kind of finding consolas with each other is going to be a very nice special moment. Um, and like one of them being how they're able to connect through their father, even though they have some hatred there towards it. Um, when they're like, yeah, father used to have like pencil shavings everywhere when, you know, um, you know, he used to shave it with his knife because he would write nonstop like his father, Bill Randa. Um, and I think that's very, very interesting to, to have it um, with those details that come into play a little later on in the episode. So that way, the audience, when they see it, they can go, oh, I know what they're that's this is this that character. You know, it's it's just great, subtle details that I think make a show all the more uh, the quality better in storytelling. Um, 
But we do learn that Hiroshi got into, or we don't know if he was officially a monarch member or maybe if he kind of just did things with monarch because we kind of learned from Lee Shaw that he says, you know, uh, I was kind of out of the game when Hiroshi appeared, you know, uh, when he kind of came around um, doing all these crazy cowboy things with me. Um, but we do also learn that, uh, of course, they have their physical copy of all Bill Randa's files, but uh, Kiersey Clemens' character, May, has digitized everything already for them. So she's she seems to be up to something. She was on a phone call, guys. What do you think about that phone call? Who's she talking to? Some people think it's an ex-boyfriend. You know, it's nothing uh, cynical. It's not them. She's not portraying them in any way. But I, I get the sense just based off her reaction, like when Kintaro even questioned her on it, her response to him seemed like an act. It didn't seem like a legit anger. It seemed like she was trying to negate the conversation and couldn't put the fault back on him so he would stop asking questions about who she was speaking to. What's what's your thought at May's plan here? What What's she up to? It's definitely the conversation that watching it a second time, I was paying attention to that. And the 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 tone that she has with the person on the other side of the phone does kind of seem like a little maybe romantic. Like she's like, hey, guess what? I'm going to be able to see you again or something. Some like, And it's just like, okay, well, what's the relationship if you're going to see them again? Um, so at first I thought maybe maybe Hiroshi maybe, but then I was like watching it a second time. I was like, no, maybe somebody... I mean, hey, she might be, you know, into <laughs> into that, but no, no judgment. But uh, <laughs> she uh, she kind of gave the sense like she it was like maybe like a, a romantic interest, maybe, and maybe that's leading her into like her little multiverse Iris West motivation of digitalizing the files and helping mm. somebody else out. You know, she's, Iris West wasn't was you know reporter, so maybe she's just kind of pulling from another multiverse. But uh, May does kind of seem like. In a weird way, like I do like her, but you don't, you can't trust her, right? Because she obviously has her own motivation of doing what she's doing. So there's a big web of conspiracies, and she somehow connects to it. I don't know. I don't know what. What do you think, Corey? Who is me? You know, what what what, what is she doing over there? Um, she hacked into that file system pretty damn quick, in my opinion. So I'm curious what her profession is, you know, truly is over there. But two, um, she's obviously, you know, somewhat involved with that family. So she would know um, who uh, Kintaro's dad is. So it, it, I did also feel same vibes from you as well, that maybe it's a romantic interest. Then I was also maybe wondering maybe it was in her dad that, or their dad that uh, she, maybe she doesn't know that it's you know him per se like he's disguised um, voice or something like that because there the the thing that I was thinking was obviously uh, Monarch knows that uh, they've accessed those files. Uh, I would assume he would also know, being uh, the owner of those files, that his files have been accessed as well. So maybe he contacted her as well. Yeah, she's definitely um, somebody to keep an eye on right now. And in some ways, too, uh, if he's living this double life, it would make sense for him to have a friend like me to kind of watch out for his, you know, family over in Japan, you know, have somebody kind of monitoring the situation. Um it's just a very interesting di dynamic so far to me. So I'm, I'm really curious to see how it plays out there. I, I, I hope we can trust her. I, I know a lot of people are saying that uh, she's a, she's a spy or uh, she's selling the information, mm -hmm. uh, playing into the paranoia. She's going to betray them. Um, yeah. I, but she might, she may, you know, find that money and uh, run off with it. Uh, Oracle's this Sally. I think she's up to no good. I, I hope that's not the case. I, you know, I she I, could I, be working with uh, um, oh gosh, is it jo Jonah's character, the the eco terrorist, you know, maybe getting information to him? Uh, because it, it does sound like there was little hints that her relationship with Kentaro kind of went south because she was kind of 
I don't know, maybe it was kind of the idea was that she was either super depressed, mentally unstable, or or maybe even did drugs, yeah. uh, or even did illegal activity, which it, she's definitely doing illegal activity, right? She's hacking into stuff. So she definitely gets herself into trouble. And it could be the very reason why Kintara was like, I don't want to be a part of that, because it seems like he wanted to live kind of a, a non, you know, uh, criminal life. Um, so I, I think there's definitely hints that she's up to something who is on the phone call. I don't, I'm not sure yet. I think we could theorize and say, maybe it is a lover of hers at this moment. And maybe it's not anything uh, of a form of betrayal at all. And she is planning on getting back. But to me, it seems like she didn't want to throw the phone away and end the conversation until she realized Kentaro was listening in on her call. Mm. Um, so it's, I, I don't think the, yeah, I, you're, you're right. Trey. And if it, I, my, but in my opinion, if anybody's going to get betrayed, it's going to be me and uh, Kentaro is going to have to help her out of it. In my opinion. Oh, that, that maybe she, it is a lover and that the lover betrays her because he's trying to get the information mm -hmm. from using her essentially. Yeah. yeah. That's a good theory. I like yeah. it. Because she's vulnerable. I, I, so I dig it. It's 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 uh, definitely interesting for sure. Um now do I want to talk about this yet? I'm gonna hold it. I'm gonna hold it. Just to, I'm gonna hold it just a smidgen longer about my build Easter it up. But, build it up, Trey. Like well, you know, there, there's there's <laughs> there's a discussion that happens, a, a theme that they keep going back to through side conversations. And I don't think it has anything to do with Kurt Russell just looking, you know, I don't think it has to do with Kurt Russell being beautiful, you know, or a good looking <laughs> dude. You know, I, I think there's a on there. Um, <laughs> hashtag she sold out. Oh, don't say that about Iris West. I'm just kidding. Kiersey Clemens, she's disappointing us all. Um, but of course. He's kind of setting up the game plan, and I think Kintaro is now he's becoming very untrusting. He's he's in a world that he has never experienced before. He's on the run from Monarch, and here this guy is calling the shots. He has no idea who he is, but at the same time, he seems to know his father very well and know certain information, and is really his only option of getting to his end goal, which is to find his dad. Uh, and when Lee Shaw is kind of saying, like, we need to stop at Korea, uh, which pretty much the, the idea behind go to Korea, I think through the simple fact is they barely got out of Japan without Monarch following their tail. The simple choice is to go to a next, you know, place of operations to meet up with his friend, um, do ho, who is going to, you know, help them get to Alaska to see this final place, which man, I got to say the do ho <laughs> short lived character, but man, I for the few minutes he was on screen, I loved this character. Like they they knew how to in a few minutes make you like this dude so that it would hurt so bad mm -hmm. when they took him out. What what is your thoughts about this do ho character? I loved him. I loved it. One of my favorite scenes I think of the episode is him uh I, I, I rewatched it. I don't know if it was him flirting with Kate or just making friendly conversation on the plane. But just kind of asking her, like, hey, you know, you're about to see your dad. And, and she's kind of, you know, this episode really gave a lot of uh, character depth, in my opinion, for Kate. Because she's very just standoffish at the start of the episode when Shaw, when when uh, Kurt Russell asks her, why are you in this? And she's like, I just want Monarch to stop following me and leave me alone. And then he asks Kentaro, what, what do you want? I want to find my dad. Me too. And then he, he's like, let's go. So he kind of takes yeah. Kentaro's lead, right? So Kate is the more uh, closed off one, obviously, of what she's the revelations, right? Uh, but when you see her with Din Ho um, kind of slowly start opening up, you know, yeah. he, she like shots, shoots him down or just like, what, do you, what does it care to you? And he's like, I'm just trying to, you know, help you uh, with your re reunion with your father. But that little interaction with them, you start to see the layers kind of you know, she doesn't really trust, I think, Shaw because he's kind of team Kentaro, but she opens up with this ancillary character, this new guy, right? Um, and they kind of have a little bit of a laugh. Um, and then slowly by the end of the episode, she's kind of like laughing with, with everybody. So um, he did a really good job just kind of like asking her, checking in with her, I think, and just seeing how she's doing. He had this, that yeah. compassion and that empathy just to check up on a friend right how are you you know how are you dealing mm -hmm. with all this? this is a lot right and yeah 
she finally kind of slowly lets her guard down. So I love that that scene with them too. Yeah, and I think you brought up a good point. Like he kind of breaks down her walls a little bit. I I think she's trying to be, she's trying to stay strong because I think she's lived a life without her father for so long that she's kind of gotten hardened about it. She kind of had to be there for her mom and kind of be the strength for her mom. And, and, and kind of, I think that's how she deals with tragedy. You know, it's, it's to kind of shut down the emotional side. You know, when the kids fell, you know, it, it was tears at first, but then she, you kind of see her like kind of the moment kind of it like passes her because she's already putting up those walls of like, all right, I got to like, I got to get focus here again. Um, and I think because of that, like, and she, she tries to hide the truth of her vulnerability, you know, with constantly saying like, he, my father's dead to me, basically. Like he's, a, he's a piece of shit. Like, don't you want to know who he cheated on first? She's very cold about the situation. Right. And like the whole moment when she's like, I don't care if I find my father, I just want Monarch off my back. And they have that sweet moment. She's just like, well, wouldn't it be great to be able to find your father and tell him this go screw himself. You know, to kind of allow her to laugh about the situation. But when they show up at that tent and they find out their father did possibly live uh, in that Alaskan plane crash, you see her kind of break down in tears and I and have that sweet moment with Kentaro, which I think is the truth of it. While she tried to say, I don't give a shit about him. You know, he was a horrible dad, a horrible husband, you know, never there for us kind of theme. To the truth is she really does want to find her dad. She does care about him. And as much as she tries to tell herself that she's not, you know, doesn't care, she does, you know, and it's allowing her and her half brother to kind of connect in a way, you know, to, to kind of peel back those layers, as someone said, um, and, and allow some of that vulnerability to kick in. Corey, what's, what's your thoughts about uh, Do Ho and uh, kind of the, the moment he has with uh, our main character, Kate? Dude, uh, yeah, I uh, actually really enjoyed Diho uh, quite a bit, and uh, I was going to mention this a little bit later on when we uh, summed up the episode, but um, I, he had such great chemistry, especially with Shaw, uh, his older character, that whole exchange in Korea and uh, um, the pulling the punches uh, portions of it all. He's, you know, uh, Beyond the Nights had definitely broke the ice, very charismatic, but it also uh, uh, gave me uh, episode three gave me uh, Indiana Jones vibes with Shaw mm. as well. How they had that, you know, why, you know, kind of wise, but you don't know what he's, you know, capable of doing type theme. Mm. And kind of uh, like uh, Salah. Yes. And then yeah. Duho comes in and, uh, um, you know, kind of saves the day, you know, ch- you know change it, you know, changes the direction, so, brought in the unexpected so immediately you got like this oh you know i wonder what adventures they've been on together before you know so um i, I really loved the vibe it was indiana jones meets godzilla and this so mm. Duho brought that uh you know you know that caring <laughs> uh fatherly advice uh but also that you know friend advice you know like to um know that she's hurting and she's upset about everything that took place, but yeah. he knew deep down, you know, like, wouldn't you want to say, go, you know, screw you to her? He, he knew how she would react if uh, he was still alive. So kind of give her that little push to kind of keep uh, going along for the journey. Um, it, it was a very endearing uh, speech as well. So um, between the two, yeah, I, I, I really like this character. It's, it, I, I'm bummed that he's uh, he's done already. Yeah, met, met his demise unfortunately because and he was just a great, like, lovable, uh, wild character. You know, kind of the wild card in the group. But uh, I, that whole plane scene, <laughs> you know, where he's like, "No, he's he's the best at you know flying at the seat of his pants." You know, <laughs> let let him do this crazy flying. And that whole thing where he's just like, here, take a swing of that. And she's like, it's just water. He's like, yeah, I know. I, I just need it for attitude, you <laughs> know, about, you know, that <laughs> was brilliant. I, for, with that scene, it just makes you love Kurt Russell, Lee Shaw's character mm-hmm. even more because he's just a badass. But not only that, you could tell this man, he's a fast thinker. You know, he, he mm-hmm. is able to adapt to different situations very easily. Um, yeah, Jonesy very very indiana jonesy right and come out on top in a way uh and i think that's just what's what's so fun about him and 
the fact that she was even able to have kind of that sense of adventure at that moment when they survived the, the plane crash and they had that good laugh. But of course, while they were flying, Kentaro saw something. Uh, we kind of got a quick glimpse of it off in the distance. It mm. looked like a, a, some type of light. I get the opinion or my, my thoughts or my theory is that it was maybe a fire, like a fireplace, like someone trying to stay warm. Maybe their father, uh, Hiroshi, long far away uh kind of staying warm and is signaling maybe the plane to let them know um what, what's your guys thoughts about what kentaro saw you want to go first Corey? yeah it was it was definitely something shiny i uh you know i, I was kind of thinking it was more of a, a signal to um how i first took it you know just like trying to like hey look over here you know kentaro might not necessarily realize that it was a signal but uh I think uh, he's going to want to help push people that direction because he he's either going to say he saw something or it's just going to feel like that's the right path, in my opinion. I, mm. um, something something is that way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's that's kind of what I was going to say too, uh, because that line of dialogue is pretty specific. When <laughs> Shaw says before they leave, or no, while they're leaving, and they figure out he was in Burrow Burrows, I think it's where they yes. He's like, well, oh, he was heading to Burroughs, yeah. But that's Burrows, not his yeah. destination or something like that. Mm -hmm. right? So so kind of what you're saying, Corey and Trey, is kind of like maybe he was trying to go somewhere else and got stranded or, you know, like that's he's like setting up shop there. Or, I don't know. Like this is just like one stop. This is not his destination. So I kind of mm -hmm. get the sense that, yeah, he's maybe away, a little bit away from the site because uh, didn't. Duho finds out when he, you know, uh, he lands the plane and he ropes it off. He finds out that that Hiroshi did the same thing. So he's like, "Oh, the plane didn't crash. Yeah, so this was intended to be set up here. This is what was supposed to happen." I guess later on, the plane got attacked right afterwards. Um, so, so yeah, I kind of think that maybe he was on his way somewhere, and maybe we're mm -hmm. seeing like a or something. Mm. okay yep. yeah it it's interesting i'm sure it's what's gonna like kind of you know whatever happens in the start of this next episode when they deal with this super cool uh titan creature um you know that's kind of gonna be like well we need to go in this direction because i saw something you know we it's there's something that's we need to check out there it could lead us to our father um very cool scene right like uh, other than it's it's sad that we lost duho um but when that um frost uh oh gosh let me they can just frost him right what's that they can just defrost him right i think the opposite <laughs> you know I, I don't think it was uh anything quite helpful but uh <laughs> yeah, this uh frost uh bark mm. there it is frost bark this frost bark uh was just such a cool titan man i loved that it had like this ability of inhalation freeze like where it looked like he was breathing in and that's what was like he, because he was breathing in it this cool you know like frost sub-zero thing started to happen a complete horrific death for sure but i just loved the cinematography of like how they're starting to figure out hey this plane didn't you know crash land here it landed safely something attacked it and it, it builds that tension and that fear of what this thing is coming for them you know and when you finally see it boy is it just a cool design i love that has these frosticle like feather frill looking like kind of porcupine thing going on mm. you know this mole looking creature just an insane design. What, what did you guys think of this uh, Frostvark uh, Titan? I didn't like it because it kind of reminded me of a face hugger, kind of, <laughs> which is oh, like yeah. things. Uh, it was it was kind of cool, like just seeing the the. I guess he's siphoning. What I guess in the opinion is he's siphoning the warmth of uh, Duho, and so it kind of like seeing that effect uh see him slowly turn into you know basically like a frozen corpse it, i got the sense that this might be a threat to to somebody who you know has atomic breath possibly if they're trying to siphon off the warmth from that from another creature mm -hmm. um and uh yeah we got like to see a little bit just a little bit of it but it's got like some imposing claws it's got like that that 
frost breath siphon thing that he's got. So he, he looks formidable. What about you, Corey? Yeah, yeah. I, I love the frost bark. It was a pretty impressive uh, creature. Seeing it kind of burrow underneath the uh, ice there. And uh, his powers were also super insane. How he just, you know, that freeze that you know sub-zero level craziness that we were seeing going on there um i think he's he scares the hell out of me dude like he's he looks ferocious you never know where he's gonna be it's uh um yeah those uh little blue old tentacles or whatever you want to call them that are look like they're already charged up and then the the, the like teeth and like it, it was interesting because I, I think I heard that uh, they're saying like he's supposed to be like like Vark from like a pig type thing, like because he burrows and everything like that. Mm. But like it, it was interesting to me that, uh, you know, he, he's obviously clearly a very um, territorial uh, of an animal because uh, he didn't uh, kill to eat. He, uh, you know, he's, he's killing things in a, in his area, so that yeah. was uh, interesting to to, to kind of see. So, um, you know, obviously we're going to get some more of him in the next episode. So, I, I, it's going to be, the, 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 from my understanding, Trey, this is the first time we've ever seen this uh, this Titan. Yeah, it's it's the first time completely uh, original design from Legendary, and I I love it. I think it's mm-hmm. uh, like uh, someone said. Uh, Joker's Wild, one of the to- uh, sorry, Toho, Toho's cool Titan designs. Did Toho make it? I think, I think, I think I know what you were saying. I'm pretty sure it's a legendary design because I don't think we've ever seen it in Toho. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I dug it. I thought it was, the abilities it had was super cool. Just kind of a frightening Titan that I can't wait to see how they try to get away from it and the problems it causes. Um, I love what Mistress of Mayhem says here, maybe protecting its young. And yeah, that could explain why it's so territorial, right? And they kind of hinted uh, at, you know, some of the other times, like those little, um, I think, endo swarm, I think is what they called it in the first episode. That mother was somewhere near uh, coming for the the baby cockroach looking things. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah. But it's such a cool Titan design. Uh, sad that we lost Duho for sure, but just a great, you know cliffhanger they leave us there you know and we don't know what's going to happen we do learn that tim and his fellow monarch agents that are after the kids and uh, after the bill randophiles we know for a certain that he didn't have any approval or uh, authority from sarazawa the head of monarch or this other woman who appeared somewhere who is uh clearly high up there's something going on there and she even says right guys that she's like we don't care about bill randa's files like but why do you care about it like what mission are you on um you know it's clearly not our mission what are you doing and he he hesitates to answer i heard a theory a rumor about tim and i'm curious to get your guys's take on it some people believe Tim, because of what the agent says, the, the French agent on the, the left in that picture, she says that there's anyone more capable in finding Shaw, it's Tim. Now, I look very close at Tim. Oh, shit. Is he the son of Lee Shaw? Oh, wow. Uh, mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. I didn't even catch that. Crazy, so that's right? Your, that's the big thing that you were uh, getting ready to tell us, huh? Nope. Okay. That's not even the big that's not even the big that's theory, not the Corey. Big one, oh, wow. That's not the big one. Oh my god, dude. This this just gets the, <laughs> the mystery gets deeper and deeper. I dude. mean it would make sense because she says like crazy knows crazy, right? So Damn. I guess they would they would consider Shaw as crazy old crackpot that we got to keep in this facility, right? Yeah, and and it also would explain how he's aware of what Bill Randa has because mm-hmm. I get the sense that Bill Randa wasn't very open about his files. Like even Brooks in Kong Skull Island, 
had no idea that Bill Randa's real mission was to find Titans, was to find, uh, you know, or or he was attacked by, a, a, you know, a creature on the USS lawn because it was one, it was confidential. He didn't, you know, um, but he's very close. Uh, he's very secretive, right? Which would explain kind of Lee Shaw also being secretive and Bill Randa's files seem to be like only a few people seem to be really aware about Bill Randa's files. So I don't know. It's, it's an interesting theory. I like the idea uh, of Lee Shaw being uh, the father of Tim in Monarch, a family <laughs> business, you know, legacy, legacy. Indeed. I don't know. Tim is ambitious. He could be, he could be very just ambitious or, I also have another theory that could tie in to Tim of why he wants um, to find Bill Randa's files. Or it could be something else. I don't know. But I, I'll tell you guys my theory now. So obviously that's where the episode ends. Leaves us on the cliffhanger with uh, the the Frost Vark. Frost Vark. Uh, causing problems for our crew. Okay. So the, uh, we're, we're about to get <clears throat> into... Uh... We're gonna our get. Big, uh, we're gonna go into our theory. big crazy theory here that right, I that haven't seen. Yep, yeah, I haven't seen anyone talk about this in the Monarch Legacy of Monsters show. All the reviews that I've hmm. watched or the breakdowns, I heard one person mention it as like I don't know where. Like they keep saying this, and it's kind of weird. I don't know what's going on here, but didn't like go into it. There's something that's said throughout the episode, or they keep bringing it up. I kind of joked about it with like, oh, it's just, they just want to keep talking about how good looking Kurt Russell is at this age. In a scene earlier in the episode, they talk about Lee Shaw with, when was Monarch founded? Late 40s. I think the year that Monarch was founded, I think it was 1947, technically, uh, in the lore canon. But... Uh, May says to Lee Shaw, Kurt Russell, wouldn't that make you like in your 90s? And he just says, I have very good genes. And then it's brought up again when he meets Du Ho in South Korea. When he says, you keep getting younger every time I see you. And once again, he kind of shrugs it off. It's just like, well, you know. They keep hinting at this, guys, that there's something going on with Lee Shaw's age. And when you think about it, yeah, he he should look much older. He should not be able to do some of the things he's able to do. Right. There was a picture that Monarch Sciences, the official Twitter account for the show and the, the MonsterVerse, posted before the show even came out of classified files. From Monarch, leaving us hints like, what are they up to? What is going on? Corey, can you bring up my uh, my little slide real quick? Classified file. Uh, the behind the scenes picture where you see that silver dome. Mm. I'm going to remove my Monarch picture so you can see. Monarch file 2548. It was titled on the Twitter page of Monarch. Operation Hourglass. Now, what is an hourglass, right? It's time. Right. And I'm thinking that the reason why Lee Shaw hasn't aged uh, the way we saw Bill Randa age is because somewhere on this Operation Hourglass that we saw in the trailer with Lee Shaw, the younger Lee Shaw, I think this has something to do with the fountain of youth or the monster verse version of the fountain of youth, mm. which is why he's been able to stay young for so long and so agile. And it could be that the very uh, thing that they are searching for that this, I mean, cause greed, right. With humanity in some ways and the, the military applications of it, maybe they're searching for where Lee Shaw and Bill Randa have found this fountain of youth. What? That, that's crazy. Bruh. What's your guys' thoughts? 
Bro. Uh, bro. <laughs> so you 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 you're absolutely right, bro. Like Shaw like like Operation uh um well, the nuke went off in 1940. 1954 is when they did the uh, Operation Lucky Dragon. And he was probably what? Um, oh, oh, I, oh like TJ, TJ, that's an interesting comment. Trey, flip the monarch symbol. What do you get? Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's an hourglass. An hourglass, Corey. And you said Indiana Jones. Yeah, oh, Corey. The Holy Holy Grail. <gasps> Whoa. Because he has to be like 25 to 30 years old in 1954. And if this is shortly after 2014, when that took place, that would put him in between 85 to 90 years old. That There's no way he's 85 to 90, like you said there. So, Trey, holy shit, bro. And it would make sense, my comment earlier about how I'm getting confused on the dates. Maybe it's yeah. by design that you're not supposed to, you're supposed to kind of get, because if you know, you're like, wait, you're going to start being led on. <gasps> but we figured it out right here on the Monarch Monsters. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I would really love, even for a replay crew who watches this later, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments uh, to hear what you guys think about this theory, because when I watched the Monarch Legacy of Monsters episode three, Secrets and Lies episode again uh, with my wife, and it just everyone, you know, Lee Shaw just kept giving a, a weird reaction. Or, and you kind of, you could tell he was shrugging it off. He's like, there's something more to it. People kept bringing it up. And when you think about it, right? Like, they're just, it, there's no way you would be able to suspend the disbelief of you know, Kurt Russell's Lee Shaw is 90 years old and he's doing all these crazy things at this age, right? There's just no way you would believe it. But then you start to connect the dots where people are like, oh, you look like you're 90. Oh, it's good genes. Dude, you keep getting younger every single time I see you. No yeah. clue how to turn on a uh, car with a push start. You do, you know, you do know Google, right? As well. I was born yesterday. <laughs> it it yeah. could have been he may have come into contact. And when I say the fountain of youth, it might not be an actual fountain of youth. But what if it was something as simple as there's a titan out there that has a certain radiation ability that can change people's biology and, and the cells within them rejuvenate mm -hmm. in a way kind of like an idea from Godzilla 2000 regeneration g1 you know where the they believed it had medical abilities right sure what if there's a titan out there that has this ability to rejuvenate cells which would make even more sense why monarch has this retirement center home for people who are never going to you know, completely right. age. The rest of them are going to age for such a long time, you know? Yeah. And it oh. could be the reason why they want to hide it. They want to keep it secret, mm -hmm. you know, because of the greed of humanity trying to, you know, what? abuse that power, that, that, you know, need. Oh my God, Trey. You guys are blowing my mind over here. The chat is over here like, oh my God. The chat is blowing up right now, Trey. The Trey. chat is blowing up right I now. I am to please, guys. I mean, yeah. it's one of those scenes where I think they did a great job playing it off as like, oh, it's it's a side comment. You know, it's, it's not really anything. But if you just pay attention to those subtle details, you mm. know, there's something going on there. And the fact that they posted this picture, classified Monarch file, 2548, Operation yeah. Hourglass is what they're calling it, time. And we know Lee Shaw because that's from the trailer. I didn't steal this. Mm -hmm. I don't have leaked information. That's from the trailer, him in the orange suit, getting into that vessel, mm -hmm. going somewhere. I think they found something. I think him and his team found something on Operation Hourglass that gave mm. him this long sustaining life. I don't know. We'd love to hear you guys' thoughts in the comments. Wow. It's a crazy That's idea, wild. but I dig oh, it and we'd love to see where it goes. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh. Comment, comment, comment if you're in the replay crew. 
yeah. you're watching this for the first time, we want to hear your thoughts. Does Trey know what he's talking about? Or is this some crazy flat earth conspiracy theory? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. But uh, Corey, I think you should clip it, make a video out of it so we can uh, blow that one up a little bit because I, I, I think there's something going on. I think there's something going on, guys. I agree. Uh, TJ says, I think, oh, sorry, go, can you go back one, court? I think this fountain is linked to what empowers the Godzilla since he's the protector of the Earth. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, it could be something like that. Uh, there's, in the Godzilla lore uh, for Monarch and uh, the legendary verse, you know, monster verse, th um, the legends, the folklore of Godzilla is that his species at one point ate a star um devoured a star and that's what gave them their abilities of the atomic breath and you know their dorsal fins lighting up and stuff like that their their sense of power i love that concept i don't think you know how lores and legends kind of become bigger than of what <clears throat> actually happened i mean it could be the hollow earth there was somewhere at the center the core a star a sun within hollow earth it could be godzilla's family his species absorbs that energy at one point and that's how they became the the alpha titan that they are um there's some believe that godzilla that our godzilla the one that we see in the current monster verse he was the only one to have this ability so he's the one that devoured the star but there's a lot of people who also think that all the godzillas had that ability i don't know it's a very interesting situation when it comes to godzilla and the legends and stuff like that but um i just love that they they keeping us guessing there's little hints subtle details and we know they're very good at small details because of the pencil shavings uh the callbacks to many different sentences like uh secrets and lies there's a difference between them they're, they're doing a lot of great things the yin and yangs uh that i don't think anything that's being done or written into the show is mm. just by coincidence i think it's purposeful you know i agree I don't know. Guys, now that we finished episode three and uh, on our way soon to episode four, wh what would you guys uh, score episode three? So for me, like uh, when I first watched it, uh, I was kind of like, oh, I really like this episode. But I was like, oh, I think that I like the first episode more. But then going back, like you were breaking it down, Trey, and talking about like the production design, like you were talking about how Kentaro and uh, Kate, yeah. like, like little things, just little uh, dichotomous things that kind of like shows that they're on, you know, connected, but they're two separate. And then just like you were talking about the pencil shavings and just the way the lines come back, the dialogue, mm -hmm. about the distinction between secrets and lies, you know, I really think that the writing of the show is just so good. Um, on second watch, I was like, oh yeah, this is my favorite episode by far. And I think it's genius because shout out to my girl, my favorite character as of episode one and two was Emiko. Miko, I think was the mom, right? Yeah. But unfortunately, I think she's not gonna be in this series too much. However, by introducing Will Shaw, you know, older Will Shaw, uh, Kurt Russell, I was immediately along the ride, along for the ride with this character. Like we talked about like the cliffhanger meeting him. He was just so, you know, you automatically love the guy and it's Kurt Russell. So he just automatically, you know, you, you kind of just fall for him and his charisma and just his uh, no nonsense attitude. He just gets right in there, gets on yeah. the going. And just those little one-off lines you think are just like little cute, little Kurt Russell things like, Oh, good jeans. Like you're talking about. Yeah. right but the way the whole episode is written so well it's not by coincidence and so the fact that you're bringing this up uh trey is really just making me like yeah this is my favorite episode by far for me uh just because of little like maybe just a little wiggle room maybe a little bit of my boy kong maybe i would give it a 9.5 nice wow okay damn that's that's a high praise because we always say 9.5 and up that's masterpiece level that's like you're doing something insanely great here um 
I like that. I, I see. And this is why I love these discussions, right? Sometimes it helps you appreciate some of the things more. Sometimes it makes you feel worse about the episode because you're like, there's just so many things wrong about it. And like you said, the, the continuity was kind of a, a consistency throughout the monster verse, you know, stories that they've focused on some of these points and events. If you look at it that way, yeah, you're probably like, ah, I hate it, you know, but I'm glad that some of our theories and kind of diving in deep into the imagery of it is helping you enjoy it even further. Corey, am, am I doing the same for you? Oh, dude, I'm a uh, lawn on a uh, monarch legacy of monsters, man. I'm loving this uh, series so far. It's getting me more and more into the kaiju world every, every day, every week. Um, I was already super hyped up on this episode. It was, uh, you know, when we finished it, uh, I, I I'm going to just let you know right now, Trey. Uh, when we watched it uh, the first time, I was already feeling 9.5 or higher. Um, after our conversations and everything like that uh, today and your, your 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 conspiracy theory, like I, I, I watched it again today because I was like, all right, you know, let's rewatch it. Let's see if I missed anything. Let's see if there's anything I would want more of. I rate television shows and series a little bit differently. Um then I rate, high rate movies and such like that because that's a complete story all at once. Um, we definitely get a lot more in depth with uh, character development in television series, which I absolutely love. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was thinking to myself, Trey, like, what more could I possibly want from this last episode three? Um, what did we get? We got, you know, Kurt Russell. Uh, an amazing order, Shaw. He gave me immediately that uh, Indiana Jones meets uh, Godzilla universe vibes. So I'm already a huge, you know, Indiana Jones fan, becoming a huge, you know, Kaiju Godzilla fan. So I, I, I was loving every single step of the story. We got Operation Lucky Dragon. So we got a nuclear blast. Uh, we got some great uh, commentary from the young Shaw. Beautiful transitions, beautiful uh, shots, uh, beautiful lines, beautiful storytelling. Um, Trey, I, I'm giving this a nine nine. A nine nine? Yeah, bro. Uh, I, it, it was it was it's perfect. I don't know what more you can possibly add to this episode to make you know. Yes, King Kong would have been absolutely fantastic yeah. in it as well. Uh, my, my, you know, I, I'm right there with the Josh Con, my con loving brother. Um, but uh, you know, like as far as a, a 50 minute episode or however long this was, the the amount of stuff that they jam packed into this episode. Get me, get me, I didn't even mention the frost bark. The frost bark was a brand new kaiju, bro. That thing was amazing. So, like, I, I don't know how much more you could have packed into this uh episode, and uh, man. Nine nine, those damn near wow. perfection. Wow, uh, uh, I'm I'm very impressed with that, Corey. Wow, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you're slowly but surely converting that. <laughs> Corey always makes me feel like I hate the show. Yeah. When uh, when he throws out his score and I go like, how is he higher than me? And it's just because I'm uh, you know like you know new into this universe, so everything's like really exciting to me right now. So yeah. Yeah, that could be hyping up the score some too. You're used to watching, you know, kaiju's and all these different things. Uh, that's that's a shows. fair point, Corey. You, you bring up a, a a great, you know, example of that of where I'm very um, versed in in this, and you know, reading the comics, reading the the art of the monster verse books, um, mm -hmm. kind of gives me some of that background knowledge where I can probably not many fans could go like, Oh, Hey, no, that's not right. That's not accurate compared to what you told me in this, okay. you know? Um, so for, for that particular reason, like I said, I really love what they're doing. I think there's great imagery. Uh, I love the character development. I know there's some fans who are just like, just give me Kaiju action, act, you know, action. And that's all I want to me. I've, I've never been a fan of just like, let them fight. And that's it. You know, to me, you kind of have to have a reason to be engaged or to feel um, connected in the situation. And how you do that is through the human element. So I, I'm a firm believer that you need the human element in a Godzilla story, you know, to to have some sort of stake in the game, you know, into the tension of what's going on. The moment it just becomes 
two monsters fighting, you kind of, while it's dope, it's awesome, it's cool, you kind of, if that's all it is, then you lose the purpose of why it matters. Um, I, me personally, because of some of the continuity errors, I couldn't like fully enjoy it to the point where I'm like, well, like, what are they doing here? This is like the third time they've kind of created like this confusion of what's happening in our timeline here. Was Shinomura there? Okay, so there's no Shinomura. I'm 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 willing to believe the comic is a soft canon because most comics, most like books are are not. And then when you watch the Godzilla 2014 special features, the monarch files of Operation Lucky Dragon that goes into detail about that operation, you even see that and you go like, okay, they're not even following their own cinematic timeline and like uh, accuracy of what happened at those events so what's happening (laughs) you know like what are we doing here did anyone do their research you you get those scenes where you question it and you're just like all right it kind of bugs me now because now i need to know why you why you did it that way um but it sounds like i'm throwing a lot of shade at this there was a lot of great things that they're setting clearly a lot of drama up between our human characters a lot of tension that new frost vark kaiju is freaking amazingly cool you got duha duho who was a a great character who broke my heart uh and once again you got a sweet moment where we're still learning about how to deal with tragedy in different ways right um and kind of finding comfort in other people helping us along the way and i do love that story and they're still keeping us on the mystery there's so much greatness going on here that it's brilliant story writing even when I can drop the continuity issues with Godzilla, you know, and that whole Operation Lucky Dragon situation, when I drop that and kind of say, okay, I'll let it, I'll let it go. I'm going to give it a 9.4. It was definitely my favorite episode Ooh, yet. Four. Definitely four. my favorite episode. Oh, why I, I can't ball? give it a masterpiece <laughs> for that simple fact, Corey. I can't just for the I, continuity. I know, really crazy, but, but that's, but that's right there, which what, what we mentioned, you know, like, you know, you see these continuity errors. I have no right. clue what, that I'm seeing a continuity error. So, it, you know, being a young guy, fan, it's, it, it makes sense why our scores are the way they are. Nine four is a fantastic score. That's your, that's the best one you've uh, said so I think far, the right? next highest score was episode one, and I gave it a 9-1 just because of how mm-hmm. they did a great job with, like, creating mm-hmm. the fear that Godzilla, you know, from the beginning of, you know, that whole storytelling of, you know, the 1954 Godzilla movies and the fear of humanity and how we deal with that situation of a giant monster like that. I felt like they really nailed that, right? This episode to me like added a whole nother layer to like the the tensions that are going on, the mystery on it. That I'm like, I'm hooked, I can't wait until episode four. Mm. Uh, and we got a great Godzilla scene, you know, him yeah. smiling at a, an atomic bomb lunch. You know, you can't beat that. Like, anytime you see the big man, like, you're like, yes, give me some more G man. Uh, JM Robles or Ro- Robles, Robles, JM. I'll just call you JM in case if I messed up your last name, I'm so sorry, brother. Um, but he says, it's good that we're, there's a human element with the series, but it shouldn't take away the spotlight from the real stars of the show. Godzilla and the Kaijus. I, I can understand that. And I think you're, you're not wrong. Um, I think it's just important. I mean, clearly, yes, we do. It's called legacy of monsters and you have the monarch element to it. Um, I, I, for TV shows, I think it's amazing that we're getting the quality of the CGI. I mean, you really do have to look at budgets and cost and things like this because studios do. And I just don't think it's financially possible to give us 20 well, minutes in every well, episode of Kaiju action, you know? Well, to combat, combat that, Trey, you know, I bet if we take the series when it's completely done and uh, take a stopwatch to all the amount of screen time kaijus are on i bet you it's going to be very comparable to some of the you know godzilla movies if not more than some of the godzilla movies with uh, the amount of time that it's uh we we have kaijus at the end i would bet yeah and you know i mean in some ways it works out very well because when you do see the kaijus you know it, it 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 has a certain impact right it holds a certain weight it's like jaws you know and even the 2014 godzilla you you didn't you saw godzilla you know footage of him unclear footage of him 
in the first couple of minutes, but it was a teaser, right? It was just enough to get you like, oh, there he is. But the, then they didn't show you anything. And then finally, the monster comes out in this epic moment against the Muto, and he gives his great roar, and they mm-hmm. teased you again. It was just enough to hook you long enough to where when you finally see Godzilla in all of his glory fighting seven minutes mm-hmm. with this Muto, that it's like it's such a satisfying thing. <laughs> it's just like Jaws, right? When you finally see the shark, you waited literally 45 minutes to see the shark and it's this giant impact and it's a terrifying moment. And I think it's the same. We live in this monarch world. If they had just Kaijus popping up everywhere now, because Godzilla showed up one day and then he went back into the ocean. I think people would be a little confused about the situation in Godzilla King of the monsters when it's the alpha Titan that Mm. awakes them all up. You know, they kind of have to play within the timeline that the Titans aren't just going to be like, oh, well, I guess the news is out. Godzilla is clearly on TV. What is TV? I don't know. Like, we're going to attack everybody. Um, but I think when they use these moments, I think we're getting something really great with, mm. you know, the new Titans. Hope I'm still hoping. I know a lot of us Toho Kaiju fans. We're still hoping to see some of our our classic Godzilla monsters out there somewhere, Rodan, maybe even appearing or, or Mothra. I think Mothra is the more likely one to appear, but it'd be cool to see something else. You know, maybe, um, I don't know, Hedora or Gigan or Anguirus. We know there's an Anguirus skeleton in King of the Monster. It'd be cool to see something for sure. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm totally think- get why some fans are like, there's too much human story. I, I need more Titans, you know? Well, and I think that's kind of like, uh, to your point, Trey, like the fact that we are like here talking about this, but like I'm kind of like Corey a little bit, you know, my my biggest Godzilla theatrical experience for me as a kid was 22, you know, 1998 Godzilla, right? Which is Zilla, I guess, and not really yeah. a Toho production that this is disavowed, right? But if you think about it, this show is now getting i think on a platform like apple tv which a lot of people have iphones right so therefore a lot of people have that service and there's something special about godzilla being seen theatrically on a big screen and now Mm. next weekend you have a full-on kaiju theatrical experience happening Mm -hmm. but yeah you're you're intimidated by that and you're not really like up for subtitles and all that you have a show that's a little bit more accessible where you have a human element to kind of have the breadcrumbs and just have the interest. And so the world is kind of not all thrown at you at once. Like for me, like I told you guys earlier, this is going to be mon- minus one is going to be my first theatrical Godzilla experience. Cause I, cool. I think I saw Godzilla 2000 thinking it was like, Oh, it's a sequel to the 98 one. That I <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, Wait, this is different. <laughs> You got an upgrade. Where did those red spikes come from? (laughs) But uh, I think it kind of works in tandem, right? We do want to see that kaiju action, but we also got to remember that this is a, you know, a TV show, but it's also helping to grow this universe really for for new fans. So I I think it's great that we have both to kind of complement each other. I like that, man. I I, I dig that. And you're absolutely right. I mean, We've said it many, many times, but what a great time it is to be a Godzilla fan right now. There's just so much content going on in that realm where, you know, the Skull Island Netflix series, the, um, you know, Godzilla X Kong, the new empire is coming out. Monarch, Godzilla minus one. You got all these comics with, you know, the DC crossover. You got the Godzilla prequel comic coming out soon. Um, There's just so much content that like, what a weird, crazy time. You usually you have to wait two five years for any godzilla thing to come out you know whether it's toho doing the film you know in the 90s it was a good thing but then when final wars came out they're like godzilla's going quite indefinitely we don't know when he's coming back you know Mm -hmm. and since then we've only gotten one toho movie which was the shin godzilla which was phenomenal but a lot of people are like why didn't we get a sequel um but luckily the monsterverse is keeping us company all in this time Corey. Out of curiosity, what's the scores that other people are saying? Yeah, buddy. Uh, Mr. The Mayhem said 9.2. Carrie Kelly gave it a 9.1. Sin okay. Havoc gave it a 9. Joker's Wild gave it a 9.3 out of 10. Nine Lives in Hell Here gave it a 9.2. Okay. Katara gave it a, a 9. 9.4 from Batwoman. An 8.9 from the Batman Who Laughs. 9.2 from the Butler. 
a 9-5 from Beyond the Night. Wow. 9-2 from Red Hooded Outlaw. Oracle Clock Tower said, love the theory trade. Made me love it more. 9.6 from Oracle oh, Clock Tower. Nice. Trevor H. gave it a 9-2. Kaiju Crazy Craig Roman gave it a 9-4 for him. King Donkey Kong, 9-2. Highest score yet. He said he will give it a solid 10 once when awaking the calm when uh, Kong in. shows up <laughs> yeah. nine, nine one from Wayne Enterprises and nine three woo okay. from Bat Fanatic nine five ten for me excellent excellent show uh, TJ says uh my hope for future episodes they are going to need to explain how they revived the mammoth titan my average score increases to eight point seven out of ten Hashtag restore the Snyder yeah. Sky says 9.2. Uh, see if there's any other scores. Uh, people freaking out when I said 9.9. Nine. That's an that's an interesting. Who said was that TJ who said about the the uh, mammoth titan? Yes. I'm trying to recall. I think it was Keen of the Monsters, the official novelization, where they said that titan was dead when they found it. Um. It maybe yeah, if they rejuvenate it, or it could always be that there was another, you know, titan of that species out there somewhere. Or what if it's the same power or rejuvenating fountain of youth thing, mm. Titan, maybe that Lee Shaw gotten you know, I mean Mothra had healing abilities, obviously with <laughs> Godzilla, so maybe it is Mothra. May whoa. Uh oh. <laughs> that's an interesting thought. What if it is all leading to Mothra and that's how they find the egg in King of the Monsters? Mm. Mm. Maybe. I don't know. That's kind of crazy. Mm. All the, the theories today. I'm loving it, man. You're, I'm, I will go down that rabbit hole anytime with you guys. I will always go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> you know, I'm. I don't know. It's it's that's the fun part, right, of these TV shows is when you get to predict what happens in episode four. Which I, I guess I'll ask you that is that real quick. I, I don't know if we're going to get Operation Hourglass yet. I think they're going to build into this uh, this tension, this mystery a little more about Lee Shaw's age, but. Uh, What's your predictions for episode four? I kind of just, I think we, uh, we maybe jumped the gun in our last predictions. Cause I think we were like, Oh, we're going to go to Alaska and we're going to find them, you know? And there was all this other stuff. Yeah. There, mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I guess kind of the same. I'll just kind of re now that we, I, we've seen episode three, which is my favorite episode so far. Um, I think we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time in Alaska, figuring out what that campsite was all about uh hopefully we'll find a potential daddy um but as far as like the operation i i wonder if there's i am kind of wondering now that your theory trey i'm i'm wondering if maybe uh we do get to see the continuation of the episode one flashback maybe somehow with uh um uh, eco um seeing her uh how she gets out of her little bed bug predicament so mm. that's kind of something i i do kind of want to see so maybe that i'm projecting what i want to see but uh okay i wonder if she has some, somehow maybe tapped into that same fountain interesting interesting idea trey mind blown sorry guys i know i i don't know if it is mother it would be cool if it was somehow like back in because let's see we don't know when Operation Hourglass happens, but clearly it was somewhere in the legacy timeline with our younger Wyatt Russell Lee Shaw. Um, so it's it's somewhere in the late 50s, early 60s at least, um, whenever that takes place. So maybe that's when they found the original Mothra that maybe laid the egg, you know, because Mothra has, if you know the Mothra movies, Mothra always, the mom leaves an egg and, you know, there's the larva that you know evolves at some point so maybe it was the original mothra um that that gave him some of that power but i don't know it's it's there's so many things you could go with but there's something going on there that's that's at least what you can take from this uh maybe kurt russell and mothra has got a deal going maybe i mean mothra has always had a connection with the you know the humans throughout godzilla lore 
Um, in the monster verse, King of the Monsters hinted at it with that one girl. She had a mm -hmm. twin, just like the yep. original Godzilla movies. Um, so, I mean, it's possible that something, you know, something. Remember, Good Mothra gene. never died. Yep. <laughs> exactly, TJ. Yeah. <laughs> but by the way, who's the baby daddy? It's Godzilla, clearly. Godzilla is definitely, <laughs> there's, there's a thing going on there between. I, I got to be honest, my wife and I, when she saw that thing, you know, with Godzilla and Mothra having that relationship, she was immediately like, I'm team Mothra all the way and I'll watch whatever Mothra movie you want to. And I was just like, nailed it. Got it, got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Parallels and uh, Interiors is what episode four is called. And I'll see if I can find, uh, I know we talked about the synopsis last time we did this. Let me see if I can find it for episode four. Yes, Parallels and Interiors. The team is left stranded in the frozen tundra after a narrow escape. Kentaro reflects on his relationship. So my guess is we'll learn about Kentaro and May a mm. little more. And maybe that'll lead into some of the mystery of what she's up to. I don't know. We'll see. Corey, yeah. your, your thoughts. <laughs> Clearly these uh, titles have references and meanings to uh, the show as well. So... Um, yeah, I, I think um, we're going to see them uh, go on the search uh, to obviously get away from this uh, crazy frost mark, but um, I think we're going to see them, you know, maybe pick up the trails of uh, somebody who uh, survived the first attack from the frost mark and uh, kind of see their journey uh, moving, um, moving away. Uh, and, and just searching where that uh, maybe their father went to. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of. Uh, um, I think we're going to see a lot more in depth of um, the old uh, Shaw or the young Shaw uh, and Randa cast as well. I think we're going to see some parallels to uh, uh, how this episode is going to play out. But the uh, interior side of thing uh, definitely, you know, brings peace my curiosity because uh, you called uh, some of the um, um, what, uh, what 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 do you call it, Trey? The uh, underneath Earth, the Hollow Earth. Hollow Earth. You, you mentioned some interior stuff with that, right? You you called like. What, what what did he specifically say? The interiors of Hollow Earth, like like the the oh the, the tunnel the the tunnels the mm -hmm. I forget what they call them in Godzilla versus Kong. I think they gave it a specific. Uh, it's it's just a pathway to Hollow Earth. There's a certain gravitational point mm -hmm. that basically shoots them mm -hmm. through, and Apex makes actually uses that technology to get through uh, from their base in Florida. All the way to uh, China, I think it is somewhere in China. Okay, so that makes me wonder if uh, they maybe find themselves a uh, a, a pathway, an, an interior pathway to uh, to cross cross through um, Hollow Earth, Trey. I like it. I like it. It's a, it's a, it's a good idea. Um, I know we'll, we'll have to see. It, it, all I can say, man. Apple TV, you're on to something here. Yes. Uh, I hope uh, it continues with its success. Guys, keep talking about it. Um, go ahead and put your last-minute comments if you have any questions uh, as we start to wrap up today's show. Uh, but TJ says, parallels and interiors, it's going to be about the hollow earth theory. It's a parallel to the earth, yet it's inside of the earth just speculating. Uh, <laughs> so TJ has kind of the same thoughts as you, Corey. Kind of, It's going to yeah. dive in a little deeper so. I'm liking it, guys. That, that's a, that's a cool idea, and you know what? It makes complete sense. I could see that that type of, you know, hint that they're they're giving away. Uh, Trevor and H coming out with another five dollars super chat, saying, "Damn good show, boys." Hashtag Monarch Months. Thank you, Trevor H. You're too kind, my man. That's uh, we always appreciate you guys so much when you support our platform, and because it just goes right back into the show. Um, to, to make it better, whether it's, you know, renewing our subscriptions like StreamYard or just, you know, doing doing other great content for you guys. So thank you so much, Trevor H., for that $5 super chat. It really does mean a lot to us because uh, I know I know it's a tough world. And when you can 
donate a little money to your favorite creators it means a lot, man. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. It, Trevor H. Thank you so much, my brother. Come on, you play my man. We, we, we want to try the uh, sure, let's that? try and find out what happens when we do this. So, Corey and I have been trying to be a little better about the copyright stuff, so we'll see how this one goes. <laughs> Trevor H., thank you so much for your damn good show, boys. Hashtag Monarch Monsters. This one. <laughs> he's got to go my go, man go, 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 go. what you got going on brother i know i know we had you on recently but maybe something's changed you know recently uh, so uh piggybacking off uh cory super bro cory's potential takeover uh i think tomorrow um so godzilla king of the monsters is going mm -hmm. to be on netflix and so Skywalker the Jedi is uh, gonna have, I guess, Super Bro Corey uh, maybe on there. So I think I might have to check out a little Godzilla King of the Monsters watch along party. Uh, Damn. So yeah, I think that's on Skywalker the Jedi's channel. Mm -hmm. um, so I might be doing that with you guys, uh, uh, peeping in the chat and seeing, cause I haven't seen, like, honestly, like Corey uh, mentioned watching Godzilla 2014, I own it. Uh, and I think that's the, actually, I own that and I own Godzilla vs. Kong, but I don't own King of the Monsters. So now that it's on Netflix, I haven't watched it in a minute. Uh, that's a great movie. And I was actually thinking about how Millie Bobby Brown's character is in, in the movie and the story. Because we were I was watching you guys talk. Um, I finally watched the Godzilla uh, Day stream fully. And so I got to get, uh, kind of deep into the minds of you guys and all the kaiju, the Toho <laughs> monsters. And so I, you know, some of the ones that were mentioned in the chat, I was like, oh, okay, I didn't know what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, I just love being a part of this panel and just learning more about the universe. And I'm excited to share with you guys my first uh, reaction to my theatrical Toho experience with Godzilla minus one in 4DX. So I will be hanging out with you guys and along for the ride and this legacy of monsters that we're on. I love, man, Josh, you are the best, sir. It's been so great. And and that's what I love about all the things going on with Godzilla lately. Like I truly like, I'm honest when I say when I was a kid in the you know mid nineties, it seemed like Godzilla was not the coolest thing in the world. Like there was a few fans out there. You had some of the, the OGs out there who loved Godzilla since the first movie come out. We we're trying to teach it to their kids. My dad used to watch it on creature features and got me addicted to it. And, you know, it always felt like if I said, Oh yeah, have you seen the Godzilla movie? And people like friends with mine would be like, huh, what? Yeah. Like the dinosaur theme? Like, oh, I mean, he's a little more than a dinosaur, but yeah. Um, you know, it was always kind of the weird thing. Corey would make fun of me all the time until I got him hooked. I, I feel like this is sweet payback right now. <laughs> you know? uh, but the, the fact that like everyone is kind of talking about Godzilla, the monster verse Kong, you know, it's, it's just like, it's a damn good time to be a Godzilla fan. And I'm glad that the old fans, I, I feel, I don't know what it is about. And I'm going to be honest, Godzilla community and my DC, my fellow DC people. My Star Wars fans are Jurassic Park fans. I just feel like Godzilla fans and MonsterVerse fans have been like so much more welcoming. Like they understand that it doesn't matter if you're an OG fan and they're like, "Well, you you don't know what you're talking about. You've never read the comics, you know, or some shit like that." Like like superhero fans would say, you know, because I've seen both sides of it. With Godzilla fans, I, from the get-go, I feel like it's always been like this new generation of fans has been coming in with the MonsterVerse. And like the old fans have just been like wrapping their arms around them and going like, welcome to the club. You know, wow. we've been waiting for you. We've been trying to tell you. <laughs> um, you know, so it makes me happy to hear new fans, whether it was the MonsterVerse that got you hooked, the old 1998 Zilla film, or even the original Shower Heisei eras. It's just awesome to see that Godzilla is still king of cinema uh, when he appears and makes his stomp in the way through the through the picture. But uh, it just warms my heart so much. So, Josh, thank you so much for always being here, brother. Really do appreciate. It. Hope to, hope to see you on again soon uh, yes, and hanging out with Skywalker and Superbro Corey. 
when they yeah. do that here, the Monsters Watch Party? I know he was talking like 4 p.m., 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. It'll be on his uh, channel, Skywalker, yeah. The Jedi. Uh, we're, we're still trying to figure out times, but I think it's going to be sometime around then. You'll you'll see a post to pop up. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so, guys, keep an eye out for that. If you don't know Skywalker the Jedi's channel, Corey, can you drop a link real quick to, to Skywalker so that way people can – subscribe to his channel and uh that way they can keep an eye out for when you guys do the watch party together keen of the monsters i'm i'm seriously i'm so bummed i even like tried to Favorite, attempt right? to like ask my wife is there like any way we could leave sunday to go to arizona she's like why so i go watch godzilla keen of the monsters <laughs> that did not work <laughs> she's like how many times have you watched that movie like a lot but my friends are watching it <laughs> hey guys uh this whole week, it's Corey's show. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Super Bro Corey channel has returned. Yeah. Hold him accountable. Make him do some episodes. <laughs> do, do some shows, Corey. I'll try to make an appearance uh, if I can. But it's <laughs> it's definitely going to be a busy week. Uh, and I know it's not the greatest time because Godzilla Minus One is coming out. But I promise we will do a whole review. We'll do a discussion on it. We'll talk. It will be a big event for the Bat Channel. But uh, keep an eye, Super Bro Corey. I'm sure he has some cool stuff planned, uh, and he, he may he may even try to just completely take over. I might lose all my admin abilities once he's you know, <laughs> doing this, and I'll never get it back. So, <laughs> is there a uh, Godzilla Christmassy movie tray? Do that that you're aware of Godzilla movie that takes place in Christmas timeline? <laughs> Not at Christmas time, but I feel like someone did create a Godzilla Christmas thing. There should be. I feel like there is. It feels I like f- it goes hand in hand. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so I don't know, Corey. You, you, you be able we'll to figure, figure some things out. We'll figure some things out. <laughs> but nonetheless, guys, uh, thank you so much once again to everyone who uh, donated through Super Chat, uh, Skywalker the Jedi um trevor h yeah. thank you guys so much for helping our platform for our replay crew leave a comment tell us about our theories curious 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 what you guys think and as always smash that like share this video subscribe if you haven't already hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode i'm your host trey with the super bro cory and our boy josh and don't forget to tune in weekly same bat time same bat channel see you later guys have a good one Trey, uh, before I, I, we got to address it. We got to address it. Ah, Corey, uh, I heard a rumor that Godzilla whooped Superman's behind. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm going to no, tell no, you no, guys. No, no, Corey, no, I, think, no. I think you should save this for video. That is a video for you to discuss. <laughs> All right, all right. If what you guys want to know video? Super Bro Corey's thoughts about Godzilla versus Superman <laughs> and uh, Superman's, you know, inevitable, inevitable demise. Um, <laughs> I, I think Corey should discuss it. It you should know? be said. <laughs> Stay tuned for Super Bro Corey's <laughs> complete. Uh, it's going to be a sad reaction, you know. <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old friend. (laughs) (laughs) Corey, what what does our poll say real quick before we end the show tonight? Um, uh, Best episode yet is 67%. Wow. Uh, It was a good episode. It was good, 29%. Men, 0%. And trash. One person said trash uh, out of 31 votes. I, if you did say trash, I don't, you no shade towards you if no. you said it was trash. I'm sure there's a lot of people who are like, Trey, not enough Titans. Uh, if it was, like, whatever your reason was for it being trash, let us know in the comments. I, I really want to hear your opinion about what's not doing it for you on this show. Um, because I think the overwhelming audience score so far has been fairly positive. Um, so anytime someone has a complete opposite reaction, I'm, I'm curious, what is it that maybe the, the writers could do better for you? Uh, cause hoping it gets a season two, but if it doesn't interest you, then why? So let us know. Curious to hear your thoughts, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. It's wonderful to see you smash. I like as always subscribe. I already said this, but we did it. You know what? We're going to, Corey, we should play which the video. One are, which we one added the subtitles in because I know it's 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 all in which, Japan. Which one know, are Japanese. we going out on? Uh, 
we will do our special message because we already did that but uh here's here's our final message here just uh from you know we we worked out the subtitles i was very surprised what it said uh in this video but here you guys go thank you so much i'm your host Trey with super real Corey and our boy josh don't forget to tune in weekly same bat time same bat channel see you later guys <laughs> <laughs>